Hello, and thank you for joining the October Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston board meeting, which is being held virtually to ensure the safety of the public, staff members, and the BPDA board members during the COVID-19 pandemic. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications. It's also being broadcasted at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Fios Channel 1962. It can also be seen live streamed at uh, www.boston.gov cable. I will begin the meeting by taking a roll call of uh, the board members. Ms. Down. Present. Mr. Monahan. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. Um, and Ted Lanz, uh, Dr. Landsmark, I think is still having some technical difficulties, so we'll um, we'll let you know when he joins in. And uh, uh, Priscilla Rojas, um, present. Okay, so uh, starting with the EDIC agenda, item number one, request authorization for the approval of the minutes of September 10th, 2020 meeting. The motion is in order. So moved. Second. All right, second. Okay, we'll do a roll call for a vote. Uh, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Honahan? Aye. Uh, Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two, request authorization to extend the tentative designation status of the Cronin Group LLC and to enter into lease negotiations with the Cronin Group LLC to facilitate the long-term lease and redevelopment of the EDIC-owned 24 Dry Dock Avenue within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Ray. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. As you recall, on January 16th, 2020, Cronin Group LLC received tentative designation status as re redeveloper for the BPDA-owned 24 Dry Dock Avenue property in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. 24 Dry Dock Avenue consists of approximately 32,000 square feet of land containing a three-story approximately 30,000 square feet plus basement building. This property is part of a larger BPDA lease with Boston Ship Repair a division of Northeast Ship Repair of Philadelphia is part of its active dry dock number three complex in the Marine Park. Because Boston Ship Repair lacked the capital to redevelop the 24 dry dock building, they, ag they agreed to work jointly with BPDA to issue an RFP for the building property in order to identify a redeveloper to leverage the economic potential of the building redevelopment to subsidize the office rent of Boston Ship Repair, thereby supporting the operations of the dry dock retaining a blue collar marine dependent industry in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Dry dock number three is the only major dry dock facility, facility in New England capable of handling large vessels such as military cargo ships and cruise vessels. It is estimated that Boston Ship Repair accounts for 100 jobs within its leasehold area as well as 500 indirect jobs. The RFP was issued on July 13, 2019 with responses due on August 14, 2019 five proposals were received. The selection committee, working with a financial consultant under contract with BPDA, and also including representatives from Boston Ship Repair, selected the proposal submitted by Cronin Group LLC as the most advantageous proposal. That determination was based upon the following. Cronin demonstrates a dedicated commitment to redevelopment within the Marine Park by planning to relocate its headquarters to the new 24 dry dock development manifesting a commitment not only to the success of the project, to the dry dock and the marine park. The proposed development program also includes significant public benefits such as permanent space in 24 dry dock for Cronin's program to assist non-English speaking employees to improve their English language skills, permanent programmable space for the nonprofit organization Save the Harbor, Save the Bay, and a commitment from nonprofit Ron Burton Training Village to join the 24 dry dock education and workforce space. Also, Cronin's highly credentialed and experienced development team, Cronin's strong financial capacity and record of financing and constructing high quality developments in Boston and specifically in the seaport, 
a development program mix that meets the regulatory constraints of the marine park and provides new office space for Boston ship repair, as well as an activated first floor, an attractive high quality design, a detailed diversity and inclusion plan that entails the meaningful participation of people of color and women in all phases of development from equity participation, planning and design to construction and building operations and a ground lease price to BPTA that exceeded the RFP's asking price and subsidizes the rent for Boston Ship Repair's office space. As you recall, Cronin's proposed development program is for an approximately $81.2 million, 123,000 square feet, five-story building plus basement with Boston Ship Repair's office space in a marine commissary and restaurant activating the first floor. The second, third, and fourth floors will accommodate general industrial tenants, including lab, research and development, testing and engineering uses per the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park Master Plan update. The fifth floor will contain supporting uses for marine research and development tenants, as well as Cronin's headquarters. Since receiving tentative designation status, Cronin has been engaged in additional due diligence than site work, including surveying. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Cronin experienced challenges with the timing of completing the due diligence as well as other aspects of the project. The Article 80 review process began with a pre-file meeting on July 22, 2020, at which the BPDA Urban Design, Climate Resilience, and Transportation Planning teams gave preliminary feedback and review to the Cronin team. Cronin's design and engineering teams are continuing to revise aspects of the project in response to this feedback. In the coming months, the team will be undergoing the Article 80 large project review um, and site investigations and other due diligence will continue. In addition, Cronin will continue working with the leasing community to identify, <coughs> excuse me, potential tenants for the building. Therefore, staff recommends that Cronin Group LLC be given an additional nine months for their tentative designation. I'm happy to answer any questions. I was on mute. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you, Ray. Do we have any questions from the board? Um, it's um, Brian. Just a comment. Um, I've known the Cronin Group and John Cronin for 20 years. He's been very active in our community, South Boston, and along the, um, the seaport. But very, very responsible and supportive of so many nonprofits. So, uh, in my mind, he's got a tremendous reputation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Ray. No, oh, thank you. Item number three, request authorization to extend the short-term license agreement with Mass Bay Brewing Company Incorporated for the use of parcel S3 within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park to operate an outdoor hospitality space. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. In March 2020, BPDA approved Harpoon Brewery's temporary change in use of their 27,000 square foot parking lot into an outdoor seasonal hospitality space. Um, Harpoon began utilizing the space in June of 2020, and the current license will expire in no on November 1st of 2020. Uh, the space is open seven days per week, subject to licensing board requirements. Uh, the fee paid to BPDA for this accommodation to Harpoon is 12.5% of their gross receipts from the hospitality space. Due to COVID-19 and the current restrictions on restaurant capacity, Harpoon has requested the continuing use of the outdoor space until December 31st, 2020. Harpoon has a beer, um, a beer hall within their brewery that they're unable to use currently uh, due to COVID. Um, we are requesting permission to extend the use through the end of the year, December 20, 31st, 2020, and they will continue to pay the 12.5% of gross receipts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes, thank you. 
Item number four, request authorization to amend the license agreement with John Moriarty and Associates Incorporated for the temporary use of a small portion of Pier 5 within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park for the live staging of two construction vehicles and construction laydown. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. In December 2018, BPA board approved a license agreement with John Moriarty Associates for the use of approximately 3,600 square feet on Pier 5 in the Raymond Elflin Marine Park. They utilized the space um, for live staging of two construction vehicles. Um, JMA currently pays BPD $1,500 per month for the use of uh, the space. Um, the, uh, uh, the license expires at the end of this month, October 31st, 2020. They have requested uh, to extend the license for uh, a minimum of six months up to 12 months and to um, add a permitted use language to allow them to do construction lay down on that space. Um, beginning November 1st, 2020, uh, they have agreed to double the price uh, that they pay us from 1500 to 3000 for as long as they use the, the space from uh, November 1st through October 31st of 2021. Thank you. That's my presentation. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. Seconded. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Don't go away. Here we go. One more. Five or two more. <laughs> <laughs> Item number five. Uh, request authorization to amend the existing ground link with ICC NE LLC for approximately 4.326 acres of land located at 2 Harbor Street within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. In 2005, Cargo Ventures entered into a lease with BPDA for a nine acre parcel of land in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Uh, they had subsequently developed a 215,000 square foot warehouse and office facility on roughly half the site, a little over four acres. In 2013, the nine acre lease was bifurcated into two separate leases. In September of 2020, Cargo Ventures sold the lease for the original 215,000 square foot facility to its largest tenant, uh, Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Cargo Ventures intends to build a 380,000 square foot research and development facility on the remaining leased premises, uh, also known as Two Harbor Street. Cargo Ventures is hoping to build a second 380,000 square foot building in the near future, pending zoning and chapter 91 approval. But for now, we're all focusing uh, our attention on the first 380,000 square foot building. The current lease is scheduled to expire in 2078 and the burden to pay real estate taxes falls on the uh, BPDA. Cargo Ventures is seeking an extension of the lease through 2120 and has agreed to the following concessions in exchange for board approval. The lease will grant the right to build, although the lease will grant the right to build up to 760,000 square feet, pending all applicable approvals, including Article 80. Um, also, the right to extend out the lease out to 99 years for an additional fee. Um, very importantly, the tax burden will shift from BPDA to Cargo Ventures. Cargo Ventures will also pay a one-time lease restructuring fee of $2 million to BPDA. And if the lease is sold after January 1st of 2021, BPDA will receive 1% of the gross sale proceeds and 2% of gross proceeds of any subsequent sale uh, going forward. Um, this, that same would apply to any net proceeds received as a result of uh, refinancing of that. I'm also very pleased to share that as part of BPDA's commitment to diversity and inclusion, BPDA is now requiring, as Ray touched on, um, of new developments to provide a diversity and inclusion plan. Cargo Ventures has agreed uh, to in, uh, include women and minority owned business enterprises in all phases of the development, including ownership, pre-development, uh, including architectural, engineering, legal, uh, the, the actual construction of the facility, and then the ongoing operations uh, of, of, the, of the facility, uh, janitorial, routine maintenance, elevated maintenance, uh, et cetera. 
Um, they've also agreed to participate in the CREST program, which is Commercial Real Estate Success Training Program, which is a comprehensive program to attract underrepresented students and women into the commercial real estate industry. Uh, they've committed to at least one CREST intern during all phases of the proposed development. Uh, I'm also pleased to announce a new addition to the BPDA business model, another addition to the BPDA business model, uh, called the Climate Resiliency Financing Program. BPDA will receive up to $250,000 per year towards reimbursement for physical improvements made to protect the Raymond Alpha Marine Park from sea level rise. Payments will be for a 30 year period. Um, they, they will be a reimbursement, however, so BPDA must invest the funds first and we will be able to collect those funds once 50% of the marine park tenants have agreed to participate, uh, which we are uh, very optimistic we will uh, be able to obtain. Um, the financial impact, within three years of the lease execution, fixed rent will increase by 41% from uh, the current $639,000 to uh, $902,000 per year. The total value of the lease payments over the term of the lease will increase by 40%. Um, transferring the pending tax liability from BPDA to Cargo Ventures cannot be overstressed. That shift alone will, will result in the total value of the lease increasing by over 233% from a potential negative value to a positive value to BPDA of over $150 million. Although it's not possible to project the future value, if and when the second building of 380,000 square feet is constructed, BPDA will receive full market value, full market rent for the development rights associated with that future building. Conservatively, we could expect the financial benefits that I just listed to at least double. That's my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? I just want to thank Dennis and the team that have. Um, is working hard to introduce these types of new terms to our leases in order to um, sustain our agency in the long run. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing and hearing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number seven, request authorization to extend rent deferments for severely impacted COVID-19 uh, impacted tenants within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park and to enter into appropriate documents in connection therewith. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at the meetings held and it, on April 16th, 2020 and July 16th, 2020, the board authorized the director to negotiate rent deferment agreements with BPDA tenants who suffered a dramatic loss of business due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Authorization has been applicable from April 2020 through September 30th of 2020. Um, the policy that was drafted was consistent with those contemplated at the time in the private sector. The, uh, the policy uh, attempted the dual goal of short-term relief for impacted tenants while preserving the financial health of BPDA. The basic business model is to grant rent relief in the short term uh, with repayment to BPDA as soon as practical to protect the financial health of the agency. BPD staff had spoken with many tenants and had distributed over 30 applications to businesses in our portfolio. Uh, 18 applications were received and to date, BPDA has offered over $2 million in rent relief. The following tenants have received rent deferment uh, through the board approved program totaling over $750,000. Echo Beauty Hair Salon at 2 Boylston Street or the China Trade Building. Uh, Pete's Dockside Restaurant at 12 Channel Street in the uh, Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park, as well as Live Nation Pavilion, also in the Marine Park. Uh, the Crosstown Hotel. Um, on Melnia Cass Boulevard and Boston Harbor Cruises on Long Wharf. Although only five companies have been recommended for def deferment through the literal um, parameters of the program, every applicant, every application was reviewed and every application applicant was contacted. 
some applicants withdrew their submission, opting not to disclose pr proprietary financial information. Others had elected to receive federal stimulus loans in, in lieu of our uh, offered program. Staff believes that for others, it was more appropriate to consider rent forgiveness rather than deferment, given the tourism focus of the business and the early stages of the economic recovery. Three tenants, um, TNTs, City View Trolley, and the New England Aquarium, which had vending locations on Long Wharf, um, received rent forgiveness totaling over $160,000. Um, two other tenants, sadly, were unable to withstand the economic pressures and have gone out of business with um, $380,000 owed in rent. For others still, staff and the applicants believe that the restructuring of the existing lease was a more appropriate, uh, via an amendment, was a more appropriate avenue to address the individual financial challenges. BPDA had negotiated and the board has subsequently approved four restructured lease amendments totaling over $400,000 in immediate relief. Those tenants were Greenside Agronomics, Boston Print Specialists, Mass Fallen Heroes, all in the 12 Channel Street building, and Cap Long Wharf, um, show for Capital Properties Long Wharf, um, on Long Wharf. Um, the economic recovery is deliberate and methodical, and we remain bullish on Boston's ultimate recovery. But the recovery will continue to take time to properly and safely reach the new normal. Staff believes that the pace of economic recovery warrants an extension of, of the rent deferment program. I have personally spoken with six companies that are interested in the extended rent deferment term. Um, because they have not formally applied, um, I'd rather not identify them verbally here, but they are outlined in the, in the board, mem board memorandum that you've received. Um, that requested short-term relief is expected to be approximately uh, just over another $300,000. In summary, roughly $1.5 million will be deferred and repaid at a later date and $500,000, roughly $500,000 will be foregone. Um, this revenue delayed or foregone is not painless to the agency, um, but tipping my hat to the BPDA Finance Department, the agency is able to withstand the shortfall due to sound fiscal management and forecasting. Uh, I am humbly requesting permission to extend the rent deferment application period through December 31st, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Down. Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Item number eight, request. I'm on sorry, Madam Chair, we skipped number six. We need to go back yeah. to it. Oh. Good. Okay, item number six, my apologies. Request authorization to execute the assignment of the ground lease with Obon Pen Co Company Incorporated to Marcus Partners to execute the assignment of the lease with Park Realty Trust to Marcus Partners and to enter into a new lease with Marcus Partners for parcel O and parcel P located within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, parcel O would be the Aubon Pan um, site that you referenced. Aubon Pan Company has been a tenant in the Raymond Elfman Marine Park since 1982. Their current lease expires in 2057. Um, they, for uh, several uh, decades, operated a bakery manufacturing facility with their corporate offices in a 36,000 square foot uh, facility located on the 69,000 square foot parcel. Um, in 2017, Aubon Pan was purchased by the Panera Bread Company. And in 2020, uh, uh, the Raymond Elfman Marine Park operations were closed and the lease was put on the market for sale. Um, parcel P is the Park Realty Trust um, or McDonald's Steel Company um, site. Park Realty Trust has also been attended in the Marine Park since 1982. Their current lease expires in 2024. Um, on the site, they operate a tool and die steel service center, primarily light manufacturing and parts equipment distribution. Uh, the building size is roughly 12,300 square feet and the parcel is uh, 24,600 square feet. 
Um, the current lease with Arbonne Pan gives them the right, uh, the right of first offer on the McDonald Steel parcel should that site ever become available. Parcels O and P combined are approximately 93,600 square feet. I'm rounding a little bit for presentation. Um, parcels are separated by Arbonne Pan Way, which is a BPDA owned roadway. Marcus Partners is a, real, is a real estate private equity firm involved in real estate uh, development, asset management, property management, and, uh, and property management. Um, Marcus is a 25 year old firm. They've developed several million square feet of residential, industrial, biomedical, office, uh, medical, mixed use developments, concentrating primarily in the Boston, New York City, Washington, DC corridor. Marcus Partners has entered into a purchase and sale agreement with both Aubon Pan and McDonald Steel to purchase the respective leases subject to BPDA board approval. Uh, Marcus Partners has proposed a new state-of-the-art research and development facility of approximately 215,000 square feet. P proposed facility is consistent with current zoning in the Raymond O'Flynn Marine Park Master Plan. However, um, it is, it is also subject to multiple other regulatory reviews that are pending, including Chapter 91, Article 80, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, and the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act. EPDA and Marcus have negotiated the terms and conditions of a lease commencement agreement. The lease commencement agreement, uh, which, which is the first step towards a lease, will allow Marcus to show sufficient site control to pursue all applicable approvals, uh, finalize negotiations with BPDA on the terms and conditions of the ground lease. I would also allow them to uh, solicit tenants, secure their equity, and secure their financing. Um, BPDA has agreement with Marcus Partners on the following business terms. It will be a 70-year ground lease ex extendable to 99 years subject to an extension fee. Rent will be based on a BPDA procured market appraisal which, which we have procured, and it indicates a fee simple value of $190 per square foot for the development rights, which equates to a land rent of uh, $9.50 per square foot of building constructed. Marcus will pay the current lease rents, uh, which are approximately combined $365,000 until the year 2024, wherein the rent will increase to $2.2 million and that rent will be subject to annual 3% annual increases. Um, Marcus has also agreed to full participation in the diversity and inclusion plan, um, which would include uh, women and minority owned business, business, businesses, excuse me, included in ownership, pre-development, construction, and the ongoing operations um, of the facility. And they will also participate in the Crest commercial real estate success training program that I referenced in the um, two harvest report presentation. Um, I'm also um, excited to announce that they will participate in a climate resiliency financing program, uh, which I also discussed in two harvest Street, which we're very uh, excited about. Um, they have agreed to what we've called an economic development fund requirement as well, wherein if they have not begun construction of the facility by 2024, they will pay the equivalent of 15% of the increased rent per month toward, um, which will be used towards um, economic opportunities and infrastructure improvements. If they, in January 2025, if they still have not started construction, that rate will increase to 20% and 25% in 2026 in the unlikely event that they haven't started construction by then. Uh, the financial impact of the agency is, is uh, dramatic. The value of the lease payments to be received by BPDA will approach $50 million, uh, which represents an increase of over 700% over the current contract rents. And thank you, that's my presentation. Great, um, do we have any questions from the board? I have, a, I have a couple of questions if I could. Um, Dennis, so I know this is two different parcels, O and P, uh, owned by two different people. Now it's going to be one owner if everything goes the way they would like it. Can you explain to me the um, the lease? So there's 37 years left on the Arbonne Pain lease, four years left with McDonald Steel, mm -hmm. and it's going to be one owner, but still two separate parcels. 
what is going to be, I heard you say 70 years, but I just didn't know um, how, if they're buying something, don't they acquire what's left on the leases? They are, yes. Thank you for asking them uh, this morning. They're, they're buying the leases as is. One, and then when once they have once the leases are assigned to them, we will negotiate a new lease for the seventy years that will incorporate both parcels in one lease. Ah. Does that happen at the end of the four years on the because the earliest one would be McDonald. Does that happen as part of the purchase? It'd be part of the purchase. Um, and it's at their risk if they do not if they back to the lease commencement agreement. If for whatever reason they're not allowed <laughs> to get uh, permits to build. That's a risk that they are taking now because they will then be the owners. They will still be the owners of the leases. Okay. And I guess it'll be, it's like three questions. Sorry to take up all the time here. So this, this new owner of two different parcels, and it ties into my other question, which will be on the Boston ship repair. Um, I'm very involved, I guess, in my day job with my other hat on the renewable energy front with offshore wind. And I heard Ray say that the, uh, the dry dock, because I didn't realize it's the largest in New England. Um, but I do Indeed know that there's a lot of um, interest and a lot of negotiating going on right now up and down the Eastern Seaboard, mainly from Maryland up to Maine on laydown areas in areas where industrial use of the marine intent. Um, and I guess where I was going is that I'm, I'm wondering about these leases and how can it possibly affect a bigger use, a better use, I think, and more a, a use that was really the park was intended for, and that was a marine industrial use. Are we approving something that's going to get in the way of possibly securing this area, this dry dock area? And um, trust me, I, I've been, I know more about this now than I ever did on, um, with the Jones Act um, and most of the people that have installed these foreign, I mean, these offshore wind facilities have been mostly in Denmark and uh, in those areas. And with the Jones Act, they cannot use foreign ships. It has to be an American made ship, it has to be manned and crewed by Americans, and we don't have the facilities. And uh, so right now, I know there's a rush amongst these developers to locate shipyards and places where they can build and retrofit. Um, ships to install these wind turbines and it's they're bigger than any meets the eye they're up as to 10 megawatts now and as high as the Prudential building that's how tall these things are the bigger the taller the bigger the output of megawatts the, the less they have to put at least they have to put in you know so I'm just curious about we have this gem right and anything we're approving here in your opinion or are we are we getting in the way of a potential use there that's going to be greater than Aubon Payne or McDonald Steel or Marcus and so on and so forth? Thank you for asking that, uh, Mr. Monahan. Um, just, just the opposite. Uh, um, we also have a great deal of affection to Boston Ship Repair, everything they brought to the, um, to the, uh, the Marine Park and the agency um, and the value of the dry dock itself. Um, uh, we've had conversations with with um, with Boston Ship Repair about both the 24 dry dock facility and the ones that we're chatting with um, uh, now with Marcus Partners to make sure it didn't affect their operations. Uh, for example, there's there's a there's a piece of land that's within the dry dock that looks very it's very appealing to developers, but uh, we are we are very appreciative that they they uh, the ship repair needs that land for lay down. And it's not. It was not on the table. Marcus didn't push for it, um, but we we are very um, sensitive to keeping the ship repair open and functioning uh, and at full employment uh, without without um, adversely affecting that by um, you know a higher and better use adjacent to it. We are we are quite sensitive to that, and we we have engaged. Uh, we have a good relationship with Boston Ship Repair, so it wasn't. You know, it, it wasn't an arduous task to call them up and, and share what we were thinking to get their feedback, which we absolutely did early in this process. That would be my only concern, because it, it is coming, and every state's legislature is increasing the percentage of electricity that must come from renewable sources. You can't cover the whole state in, in solar panels, so wind is really the only place we can get it from, or Hydro-Quebec, 
which ties into another piece, there's a, it's been on the board for a long time, is landing a cable from Hydro-Quebec through, through Maine and then through the coast and right into K Street substation. And I would imagine they'll, you know, they'll look at anywhere in that EDIC, it's right there. When you come out, obviously K Street's right across um, there. So that's my only concern, that anything we're approving here is gonna be getting in the way of something bigger and better in my opinion. Um, and, um, and Marcus isn't gonna be able to, uh, similar to Gillette on, uh, on A Street, they're not gonna be able to object to anything and have standing in any manner that's gonna dwarf or stunt the growth of that industry. Um, on, if I, I could sure, go ahead, go down. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank Dennis. And just for the record, I'm Devin Quirk, Director of Real Estate. Um, I agree with everything you said, Mr. Monahan, and I, I agree with Dennis's uh, response. And I just wanted to add that, I mean, like Dennis has said, the Boston Ship Repair is the quintessential maritime user. It's the Raymond Elfland Marine Park. And, a, and our mission here is to preserve maritime uses and to find opportunities to use cross subsidy to support the maritime economy. And you've already heard Ray's presentation about. 24 dry dock and how we're, we're doing exactly that in a very obvious way in partnership with the ship repair um, and the Cronin group. I, I think one thing that Dennis said that I just want to emphasize is that there is a, today's vote is about the, um, the, tr the assignment of these leases and that, and the uh, hypothetical or the, the, the theoretical uh, lease structure should a new development proceed. But as Dennis mentioned, it's at Marcus's risk and there is significant uh, due diligence and work and approval processes ahead uh, where all the issues that you're raising will be vetted uh, to ensure that, that um, the, the new development as it takes shape is it does not negatively impact any abutting tenants, any, any uses or, or provides the appropriate mitigation itself. So there's, uh, I, I just wanna make sure that we all understand that this is not an approval for a, for a specific development yet. There will be an Article 80 vote at some point in the future should that, um, should that, uh, prop, should that uh, development emerge. And if I could just add one thing, um, uh, we Boston Ship Repair, we were looking out, you know, for their interest as, as a landlord, but Marcus has also uh, reached out to them on their own, um, and they are, uh, deter you know, they are committed to being good neighbors and not impacting uh, Boston Ship Repair either. So that, that I just, I didn't want that to be lost. Mar Marcus is very much a partner in that. Thank you. That's it. Any further questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you all. Um, item number eight, correct? I think, I'm, I think I'm back on track. Okay. You're, back on track. You're good. <laughs> okay. Um, request authorization to adopt designer selection procedures in accordance with MGLC 7C and all other applicable laws. Thank you, Madam Chair. Brian Connolly, Director of Finance, members of the board, Director Golden, Secretary Polemus. I'm, I am before you presenting for your approval designer selection procedures as outlined in. Massachusetts General Laws uh, 7, Chapter 7C. Our past designer selection procurements were pro properly executed, though they were done so in an ad hoc fashion. For us to move forward with Chapter 7, we must adopt formal procedures as they're outlined under the statute. Doing so assures greater clarity and consistency for us as well as vendors in the way we carry out our designer selection procurements and further aligns our internal procurement practices with the state best practices. So you're aware the CPO will oversee designer selection committee, but we would still be required to appear before the board for approval of each contract. Also, this is a procedural clarification that falls in line with the mayor's executive order on inclusive procurement. I'm joined this evening by uh, Michelle Goldberg, budget director and Dominique Sanon, public procurement specialist. And we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Could you go into a little bit more detail about uh, how this change will impact on um, our efforts and the mayor's efforts to 
increase the number of uh, people of color and women who are designers uh, who end up being uh, selected by this agency? Sure, Brian, do you mind if I yes. ask that? Yes, I was just going to say, Michelle. Thank you. Sure. Um, hi, good evening, Michelle Goldberg. Um, so our theory here is um, that by uh, putting it through the board, carrying it um, uh, with us and being able to share it consistently and publicly would allow folks um, who are right on the cusp who are preparing or trying to ramp up and prepare to participate in this process, um, they have a better sense of what the playing field looks like. It also helps our internal staff um, not have to go through the process of each time sitting down and affirming um, what we're doing, but uh, this document is the result of a collaborative effort uh, with our legal department, um, as well as the real estate group. Um, and so we feel that this um, will also speed up our ability uh, to put projects out, um, therefore getting more in the market, um, getting our buying plan done earlier, um, so on and so forth. So I think the, the that was a long answer, and the, sh the simple answer is um, it allows people to have a better sense of, of what to expect when they engage with us. Does that help? Um, a little. It, it sounds as though um, the, the goal is to increase the amount of information about the procurement process. And I just wonder sure. how, in application, sure. um, you, you perceive that that will actually lead to uh, more inclusivity. Yes. I think uh, Dominique has a, a great anecdote. Um, uh, Dominique, do you, can you share? Um, yes. How you uh, 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 good, good afternoon. Uh, everyone from the board. My name is Dominique. I am the public procurement specialist uh, at the BPDA. Uh, with respect uh, to this particular information, for instance, uh, with the designer uh, selection process and procedures, I am, for instance, yesterday, I actually, there was an outreach from a woman-owned design build firm. And based on that uh, design of selection procedures, I was able to explain to her and um, uh, the processes by which we select designers because she wanted to know about like the BPDA processes for uh, being able to participate in the procurement. And then I was able to say, these are our designer selection processes and procedures, which clarifies the process for her to know, um, first of all, how to, uh, go and get certification from the city of Boston and the state, and also with respect to the BPD, understanding that while the BPD may not do the certification, but these are the processes and procedures for the designer selection, and I was able to share the documents, uh, past documents with her to show those processes and procedures to clarify the process for her. She's a new vendor in the market, and then she's looking to the business with the city, and these processes and procedures are really helpful with that. And if we approve this, um, how will this change be publicized so that uh, more people know about it? Sure. So I think um, in some ways uh, it'll uh, probably what we should probably be doing, I guess, this is a kind of a forward thinking question. Um, we would carry it in our, uh, in our solicitations, in our request for um, for vendors, uh, so it would be provided at the time of bidding. I think uh, we're also going to carry it with us when we do our engagements. So we work closely with OED, and um, I think just next week we're going to be participating in our um, uh, the their virtual engagement. Um, so trying to do some outreach there, um, you know. And I, I would welcome your suggestions as well um, if you think that there are um, great places that we could post it or share it. Um, you know, we're, we're eager for input as well. That's fine. Offline. Thank you. Okay, great. Does anybody else have any questions um, on the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number nine, uh, we have the um, FY20 end of the year budget update. Michelle. Uh, 
Hello, again, good afternoon. Michelle Goldberg, Budget Director for the BPDA. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary. I'm pleased to join you today for a brief presentation of the final budget numbers for FY20. Although we are already four months into FY21, reviewing this information will help us better understand what we see going forward. Mm -hmm. When it comes to fiscal year 2020, there are basically two main stories. First, of course, everyone is interested in understanding how the COVID outbreak impacted BPDA's operations. The lesser known story that I'll start with though is that the BPDA was able to realize a substantial reduction in our long-term liabilities for other post-employment benefits, which are the health care costs associated for our retirees. I have a few slides prepared and then I'm happy to take a few questions. So we can hop to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, fiscal year 2020 began on July 1st, 2019 and concluded on June 30th, 2020. By and large, the agency performed exactly on budget. The first three quarters included several one-time items that were, uh, that were budgeted for. Parking revenue was performing better than expected and our attrition rates were holding steady. The only budget items that were lagging were two large construction projects in the operating budget the demolition of Building 108 and the sinkhole culvert pairs of the Charlestown Navy Yard. So when we look at this table, traditionally what I like to do is draw folks' attention to rental and leases and then just kind of walk through the table. But this time, I'd actually like to draw folks to the interest and other income line, which is $7.2 million. Um, that actually represents our non-cash item that I was referencing. Um, and so, uh, let's see, where's my note on that? <laughs> so uh, finance was working through an OPEB recalculation. One of our largest expenses that we have is our pension and post-retirement health care benefits for former employees. Those liabilities are associated, or sorry, are assessed by the state of Massachusetts and a variety of actuaries help manage this. An error was identified in the calculation. This was not a BPDA error, but it meant that future liabilities had to be recalculated. With that change, the BPDA not only owned, uh, owed less for the current year obligations, our future, future year liabilities were drastically reduced. Together, the value of this change was roughly $10 million in payments that we will no longer have to make. In order to properly account for this future reduction in future liabilities, we had to recognize this as a non-cash item. And so that's what that number represents. Um, uh, this was our way of accounting for the fact that there's money we won't be spending in the future. Uh, this change, along with the others uh, we had implemented, uh, such as going partially self-insured, um, improving our disability leave offering, puts the BPDA in a really strong position when it comes to uh, benefits and long-term liabilities. Um, and I do have Brian here as well, uh, Brian Connolly, to help um, if you guys have specific questions on that. Um, when it comes to COVID, and here we can actually flip to the next slide here because I've got some highlights that we can go over as well. And then we can flip back to the table if folks would like. Uh, we were in the process of building FY21 right around the time that uh, COVID hit and we had to very quickly start to focus back in on the fourth quarter. Um, the community meetings halted and staff were asked to go home and try to figure out how to do what we do from home. Uh, but today reflecting on that, it really was a gift because it brought out the best of the BPDA. The real estate and finance and legal teams uh, immediately convened a group to work with our tenants. Uh, Dennis shared earlier the great work that this group has done in establishing the rent deferment program. It has, uh, they helped support our projections through the fourth quarter and informed our assessments uh, for FY21. In the fourth quarter of FY20, the BPDA deferred roughly $300,000 in lease revenue. Uh, we appreciate your vote earlier to extend this program and did make um, assumptions in the budget going forward around that. The BPDA has different objectives and fewer options when it comes to mitigating the impact of COVID-19 and what it did to our parking revenue. With the shutdown and persistent uh, social distancing requirements, parking revenue experienced a sharp decline in the final months of FY20. Can we flip to that next slide? Just a moment. 
Uh, so here we wanted to demonstrate uh, exactly how that played out. We have two types uh, in, of parking revenue. Uh, the yellow is um, our, our transient event crews, things that um, are variable. And the blue stack is part of our monthlies. And the orange line represents um, what our parking managers were pro projecting. Um, the, the you know, kind of dotted purple line is what we were hoping for for next year. And then the gray dotted line um, was the assumption we made for the first, first quarter of 21. As you can see, we had a sharp decline in April and May. We also did a, kind of a modified deferment program uh, where our parking manager uh, negotiated with some of our monthly pass holders um, to postpone or delay payment uh, for one or two months um, in order to hold their spot. Uh, I think the going theory here is let's wait and see if people start to come back to work um, or how, you know, it already seems like folks are getting creative on how to have socially distant events. Um, and so there's, there's still a lot to figure out here. Um, but of all of the activity that happened in the, first, the fourth quarter and for FY21, it really was around parking. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, so uh, hearing and seeing none. Um, and there's no vote required. <laughs> right, <okay. laughs> just an update. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for this, this very um, comprehensive budget update, Michelle. All right, um, last item on the EDIC agenda, um, number 10 personnel. Jamie? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, for the record, Jamie Marco within the Human Resources Department. A few items for your consideration under the EDIC agenda. Five appointments. Uh, Stephanie Jeannot, Junior Finance Coordinator within the Finance Department. Christopher Worrell, Assistant Director of Community Engagement within the Director's Office. Barry Reeves. Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion within the Director's Office. Brandon Stanaway, Research Assistant within the Research Department. And Samantha Devine, Transportation Planner number two within the Planning Department. Um, we have one Employment Services Contractor, Beno Desois, Financial Navigator within the Office of, um, Office of Workforce Development. And then two status change requests with salary adjustments for Ken and Ryan to be interim deputy director of downtown and neighborhood planning and uh, Muggsy Udemeyer, interim assistant deputy director of downtown and neighborhood planning. And then there will be one departure of Stephen Norton. He's a property maintenance technician within the real estate operations and his resignation was effective September 11th. Um, all of the details to all of those items are listed within the board memo, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Jamie, uh, any questions uh, from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none. Um, motion is in order. So moved. Thank you. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Priscilla. Just so you know, also, just to give you a heads up, when the when the BRA agenda comes up with personnel, there's there's not gonna be an item there, so you guys can just move past it. Woo, go home early, an extra five minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're already at home, actually, so I <laughs> turn the camera off. But, um, all right, so that concludes the agenda for the um, EDIC portion of the meeting. Um, I need a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn the EDIC meeting. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes, meeting adjourned. Okay my papers and let's get started on 
the BPDA portion of tonight's meeting to thank you for joining the October Boston Redevelopment Authority Board meeting, which is being held virtually to ensure the safety of the public, staff members, and the BPDA board members during the COVID-19 pandemic. The open meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Fios Channel 1962. It is also live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. So to begin the meeting, I will take a roll call of the members. Uh, Ms. Downs. Present. Uh, Mr. Monaghan. Present. Dr. Landsmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. And the chair um, is present. Okay, um, item number one. Request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the September 10th, 2020 meeting and September 24th, 2020 meeting. The motion is in order. So moved. Second. Hey, um, may, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. I'm going to read the um, next three items together and we'll take one vote. Item number two, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on November 12, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. or at a time and date deemed appropriate by the director to consider the proposed Simmons University 2020 Institutional Master Plan and to consider the Living and Learning Center project as a development impact project. Item number three, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on November 12, 2020 at 5.40 p.m. or at such a time and date deemed appropriate by the director to consider the proposed Sixth Amendment to the Boston University Charles River Campus 2013 to 2023 Institutional Master Plan. Item number four, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on November 12, 2020 at 5.50 p.m or at a time and date deemed appropriate by the director to consider the application of Trinity Orient Heights phase three limited partnership for authorization and approval of a project under Massachusetts general laws, chapter 121A and the acts of 1960 chapter 652 each as amended. So I um, need a motion to schedule those three uh, public hearings. I move we schedule the public hearings. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, meetings scheduled. All right, uh, number five uh, is Board of Appeal, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hamas, Director Golden. Uh, 86 petitions have been prepared tonight for transmittal to the Zoning Board of Appeal. Uh, these will cover four meetings uh, of the Board of Appeal, including their subcommittee meeting tonight uh, and their three public hearings scheduled for October 20th, 27th, and November 10th. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Uh, do we have any uh, questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Item number six, request authorization to amend the smart utilities pol policy for Article 80 development review and incorporate such amendments in to the BPDA's development review uh, guidelines. Uh, Manuel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Director, Director Golden, and Madam Secretary. I'm Manuel Escrivel, pronouns he, him, his, Senior Infrastructure and Energy Planner in the Transportation and Infrastructure Division. Um, I'll start by giving a brief overview um, of the Smart Utilities Program. Then I'll go over the assessment of the Smart Utilities Pilot Policy that was approved by the board two years ago in June of 2018, and the corresponding proposed updates to this policy that we're looking to get approved by the board today. Um, last, I'll cover two lines of work that we propose to roll into the program. 
um, inclusion of these lines of work into the policy would be forthcoming based on the results of the policy development and work that we will carry out, as I'll describe later. Um, next. And next. You may recall the various challenges that the Smart Utilities Program looked to address, excessive flooding and potential power outages, and our need to build resilience in the face of climate change, uh, repetitive street openings, and the challenge of streets that already house a lot of infrastructure, traffic congestions, and our need to support technology and infrastructure for, mo uh, for other modes of transportation, as well as our needs to equip the city with infrastructure for useful technology such as sensors and other smart city solutions. Um, what all these have in common is that they need to share the space under our streets, so we need a program that provides a framework for coordination across these sectors. Next. The Smart Utilities Program provides a new model for efficient utility planning, design, and coordination, and encourages the deployment of what we call smart utility technology. Next. By setting up, a program, setting up a program with these objectives, we can focus not only on efficiency, but we can also identify opportunities to do this more equitably across the city and in ways that support resilience, economic development, and innovation. Next. The Smart Utility Steering Committee has been meeting bi-weekly, weekly at times, since the beginning of the program in 2016, and it brings together eight different uh, agencies and departments. Next. We have two main implementation tools. One of them, as we'll recall, is the Smart Utilities Policy for Article 80 Development Review, which was adopted in June of 2018 as a three-year pilot. As you may recall, this policy calls for the integration of five smart utility technologies into projects subject to Article 80 of the Boston Zoning Code. Each technology applies at a different size threshold and has different specifications, as I'll cover in the next section of the presentation. The updates to this policy and these five technologies is, again, what we're looking for the board to adopt today. Next. Um, the second implementation tool is the Smart Utility Standards, which provides standards for the layout of utility infrastructure underground, including showing how it's possible to leave space for new infrastructure in some streets, as well as standards for uh, pulling the infrastructure into the building. Next. So this covers the Smart Utilities Program in a nutshell, and just for context and as a reminder, now let's jump into the assessment and proposed update to uh, one of these implementation tools, the 2018 Pilot Policy. Next. So looking at some overall statistics, we've interacted with 105 projects subject to Article 80. 44 of these projects have been approved by the board, and 61 are still under review, totaling um, over 57 million square feet of development. Next. Figure two shows how many projects have been or are being reviewed for each smart utility technology and smart utility center item. Um, you see that based on the site threshold for each item, there's a wide variation in applicability. Uh, the easier aspects of the policy, such as green infrastructure, um, apply to a large number of projects, while the more complex ones apply to a smaller number of projects. Next. So now we can review each of these technologies one by one. Next. Green infrastructure um, applies to projects over 100,000 square feet and calls for the retention of one or quarter inches of stormwater. This is a quarter inch over the one inch baseline that applies to all projects in the city. Um, green infrastructure is an approach to water management that looks to mimic and restore natural processes. And the benefits include stormwater retention, pollution control, and mitigation of urban heat island effects. Uh, next. Through the policy, we've achieved an increased amount of stormwater retention. We can estimate over 88,000 cubic uh, feet of additional stormwater across 46 projects that have completed the review process. This is the amount of water associated with the additional quarter inch and can be visualized as the amount of water that would cover 18 football fields with one inch of water. Um, this is great. However, it's been mostly achieved through the use of infiltration chambers, which do not necessarily carry the other co-benefits of green infrastructure. Next. So moving forward, we propose for the policy to apply, still apply at 100,000 square feet and still call for the one and a quarter inch retention. But to emphasize that it's the intent of this policy to promote other types of green infrastructure um, using priority maps. Next. For example, we can use our urban heat island effect map prepared by the Climate Ready Boston um, project program to make sure that projects in these zones are deploying appropriate greenhouse gas, greenhouse, uh, green infrastructure measures to address this challenge. Next. The second technology is adaptive signal technology. Next. And next. This applies to projects requiring traffic signal installation or improvements. Uh, ASD looks to create a network of signals that communicate in order to improve traffic flow. Uh, as part of the Smart Utilities Program, we're interested in promoting technology that supports all modes of transportation. Next. 
While we need to wait for the ASD standards that will result from the ASD pilot program in the Seaport District, we've identified opportunities to promote other useful technology and infrastructure to support other BTD programs, such as connecting currently unconnected traffic signals to the BTD network. Next. So we're looking for the policy to widen its scope from ASP to include traffic transit bike and pet supporting technology and infrastructure. In this way, if a project is in close proximity to a corridor of interest for a particular traffic transit bike and pet program, we can assess whether it's within the project scope of work to support such a program with infrastructure and technology. Uh, next. And next. The third technology is smart streetlights. This currently applies to projects requiring new streetlight installation or improvements and calls for the additional, um, for additional electric and fiber capacity at the pole. Smart streetlights refer to smart technology mounted on traditional light poles, such as cameras, antennas, and sensors to support safety, enhancement of telecom services, traffic management, uh, pollution control, et cetera. Next. What we have learned is that we do not need to rely on the installation of new light poles in order to get the additional capacity for electric and fiber that we're looking for. We can instead focus on whether a project will result on significant sidewalk reconstruction. Next. Um, we have already been working successfully with some project proponents on this, so we're looking for the policy to formally reflect this change of focus from light pole installation to significant sidewalk reconstruction. Next. The fourth technology is a telecom utility or next. This currently applies to projects proposed, uh, proposing over one and a half million square feet of development or half a mile of roadway. Um, a telecom utility is simply a dock tank with increased capacity for telecom services. And the main benefit we're after is mitigating repetitive street openings due to telecom work. Next. We are currently collaborating successfully on the design elements of a telecom utility, such as number of conduits, location of manholes, with the project proponents that are required to comply with this particular policy. So no change there. But in these last two years, we have realized that it would be possible to coordinate the integration of a telecom utility in areas of interest regardless of project size. So we're looking for the policy next um, to also apply to projects lower than one and a half million square feet with significant street reconstruction as part of their scope of work and within a telecom utility corridor, corridor, corridor of interest to integrate this asset. An example of a corridor of interest like this one would be um, the plan.app planning initiative. Uh, next. The next technology and the last one is district energy microgrid. Next. This currently applies to projects over one and a half million square feet. Project proponents must first carry out a feasibility assessment that gets reviewed in an iterative manner with an energy expert on our side of the table. Um, and the aspects of the feasibility assessment that are deemed feasible are turned into an energy master plan that speaks to the facing in of the development. District energy microgrids are energy systems for clusters of buildings that can provide localized energy. Benefits include opportunities to decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions, decrease energy and ownable cost, and increase site resilience when disconnected from the grid. Um, the different feasibility assessments so far have resulted in different tailored solutions, including in building cogen, cogeneration, district energy microgrid ready design for streets and buildings, and robust rooftop TV and battery storage analysis. Next. So moving forward, we're looking to maintain the size threshold as well as, well as the feasibility of the master plan mechanism, but to specifically emphasize that the goal of the program is to prioritize renewable in alignment with the city's carbon neutrality goals. Next. And that covers what I just said. So next. Um, this covers the assessment and update, update of the 2018 policy, uh, which we're looking for the board to adopt today. As I mentioned at the beginning, there's two um, new items we're looking to roll into the program, which I'll cover uh, next, today we're only presenting what we're proposing to include into the program um, since we need to do stakeholder engagement to then come back to the board to request for it to be approved into a policy form. And we expect to come back to the board in six to 12 months um, with that request. Uh, next. So I'll just go over this too quickly and I'll open it up to questions. The first line of work is solar battery EV microgrids, which are energy systems for clusters of buildings, but it integrate these assets and can disconnect from the grid to provide uh, resilient benefits. Next. While it's not always today to uh, integrate buildings into microgrids due in part to the regulatory uh, constraints, we have identified an opportunity to work with developers to make sure that the buildings at least are designed for this future. Next. So our vision is to collaborate with stakeholders to define microgrid ready standards that would be possible to integrate into all, um, all buildings. Next. And next, the second uh, line of work is smart broadband buildings. 
is refers to um, uh, buildings that can integrate standards to ensure that they're ready to serve current and future connectivity needs. This is the potential to enable competition in the telecom sector, attract businesses and institutions, mitigate repetitive street openings, and other benefits that are aligned with the Smart Utility Program goals. Next. This line of work is already part of Article 80 development review through the uh, broadband ready buildings checklist. There's an opportunity to digest it and swallow it into the smart utilities program. Next. So similar to the first line of work, we would be looking to develop uh, through stakeholder engagement standards that can apply to all of the all Article 80 projects. Next. So this covers the last, the two new lines of work. Now um, we can address any questions if, if you have any. I'll display next, please the five items of the policy that we're looking for the board to adopt today. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions or comments from the board? When would all of this uh, be applied to the Article AD projects? This would apply beginning tomorrow after board approval. Now, mm -hmm. that's an interesting question though because some of these items we're only formally adopting into the policy. We've already been testing it out in collaboration with developers and stakeholders. Some of these changes come from their uh, feedback. So some of these things were already uh, deploying. I, I note uh, with interest that one of your images shows the intersection of Mass Ave and Newbury Street and one of the other uh, points of uh, concern that you raised uh, covered Mass Ave and, and Beacon Street. That is an area where uh, we've approved a, a very large uh, construction project and development project over the Mass Turnpike. And it really is one of the key points of entry um, into the city uh, from Cambridge and uh, onto the Mass Turnpike. So it, it is a very complex intersection and I wonder to what extent uh, this policy uh, could be applied both uh, during the shorter term um, of the construction process uh, which will last several years at that site and then in the longer term uh, towards uh, the possible uh, uh, use of microgrid uh, through that area to uh, reduce some of the energy consumption and take advantage uh, of, of some of the assets available in that area for um, uh, generating renewable energy. Uh, yeah, so regarding your first comment, the um, when it comes to the implementation of the program, when we interact with the project, we first ask for a utility site plan to show how all the utility systems are gonna be brought into a building. And we then review this with the steering committee and. Um, what we call the review committee of the program as well, so that uh, which involves PAC, public works, PTV, et cetera, water and sewer, um, so that we can have a conversation about what changes need to be made. Um, maybe there's a, a suggestion on let's pull this piece of infrastructure through a private street instead of a public street to mitigate disruption. And this happens at different touch points during the BPDA review process as well as um, closer to getting a building permit and then um, during construction. We just started it. so. We're only starting now to interact with the buildings that are uh, going into construction. So we'll be, I guess, continuing to pilot or uh, test that part of the program. But the idea is to continue to have touch points with this project so that we can continue to guide um, efficient coordination around utilities. Now, regarding the project that you mentioned on Mass Ave, that project will be collecting the water and quarter inches of stormwater. So the green infrastructure part is uh, integrated. Um, they will be providing additional conduit on the sidewalks to the extent possible, and I can't remember which sidewalks that make, made sense on, um, so that we can in the future integrate um, smart technologies, smart sensors that can also help the traffic transit um, parts of the city's programs. Um, and then regarding microgrids, at this point, it's such a complex part of the program that we need to continue to test it out um, with larger developers and largest programs. We're learning a lot through this pro uh, program. The idea is that that learning in a few years, and especially as the regulatory context changes, we would be able to start integrating some of that, those lessons learned into smaller developments across the city and integrate some of those um, benefits to um, the communities at large. Thank you. 
Okay, any other uh, questions or comments from the board? I have one question from Manuel. Manuel, can you explain to me, using the uh, project that Ted referred to as an example there in Mass Ave, right? So the, the duck bank portion of this add on. So the developer as always brings his duck banks into the building for both fiber for, you know, whatever voltage is coming in there, 13.8, the 4160 or whatever it is that's coming into the building and the utility, you know, delivers the power. Give me an example on this duck bank, telecom duck bank and how you envision it, right? I got a build, I got a hole in the ground and I'm gonna put a building up. Um, mm -hmm. So is it just the duck bank and the sidewalk is just gonna be for the area of that building and on the sidewalk or are they gonna, yep. it's gonna be required to extend it further down the street and 100, 100 feet either way and then hopefully down the road another development comes up and picks up where that one left off and where is, where is home for all of these duck banks? Yeah, so the telecom utility order which requires the duck banks for telecom applies at one and a half million square feet or half a road, um, half a mile of road construction. And the idea there is to do what you're talking about, be able to work with the developers of these large sites or with long stretches of roads so that um, whatever goes in today with phase one of a development is ready with enough capacity to serve the next building. Um, and the idea would be to um, ask the right questions and have enough information on the site plans so that we we know and they show to us how this system is is growing so that parts of the streets that have already been prepared or paved don't have to be opened up again um yeah does that answer your question it, it kind of does but if we could use a seaport as an example the federal courthouse was the first building really down there except for john drew's hotel and since then, looking at the water or looking at the airport from the federal courthouse going right into, let's say, into the Marine Industrial Park, right, going that direction, every developer would have been required to have the frontage of their building, whatever you decide it is, right, 12 two-inch PVCs or whatever size duck banks you want, right? So, okay, I'm responsible for this. The next developer picks it up, picks it up, picks it up. And, of course, it goes into their building also. Where's home? Where does it where does it go? I mean, eventually, okay. Right now, I'm right down at four point. I'm at the bridge there, right at, right in Southie, right. I'm about to go over the bridge where the L Street Powerhouse is. So, okay, now the next person, what? They take it in the Southie, and then where does it go? Where's home for all this? Is yeah. It, is it a um, is it a Verizon uh, outdoor for you know what I mean? Is it? Where, yeah, I can talk about a project that we're um, actively sort of going through the design process with it. I get your question now. And the Seaport District is one of the examples of a place where we would, would have liked to uh, deploy this infrastructure so that we didn't have to dig the streets every time a new building came through and need it to pull infrastructure from a particular um, uh, provider. And so the idea is that we have developers talk to the provider and assess how much capacity they're going to need for uh, the entire entirety of the, of the, of the site. Um, they might be working with two different providers, and so they might want to ask the same questions to two providers. That's what's happening in some projects. And both providers right now are asking for a certain X amount of capacity. So the developer um, makes sure that that is uh, included there. And then we also, there's a policy where the city gets what's known as shadow conduit uh, to run parallel to that. And that shadow has to be of the same size as the capacity that's been um, given to the other providers with it's separate uh, manholes. And so the idea would be is um, if one developer wants to work with one provider, then they know that that provider has told them how much capacity they're gonna need for the entirety of the site. Um, but we still wanna make sure that we leave it open for other providers to open up the competition. And so that's why we, we have the ask for the shadow conduit, which in this case would become uh, another uh, version of the dock bank. And that dock bank would have, the, it might not be connected to any particular provider, Verizon or any other provider, but it's designed in a way so that the city or any provider could ask the city to use that dock bank and they would be able to connect wherever they need to connect it, minimizing the stretches that they would need to, to build toward in order to, to connect into the manhole where these, where these um, utilities would begin or end. Um, so it's not perfect. There would still be some level of 
construction needed, but the idea is to minimize it and to only have to work on sort of the, the last mile stretch when someone wants to use this asset. And who owns it? Uh, great question. Um, the city will be owning, owning the conduit. We are working with Public Works um, and the Chief of Streets to um, understand what the operation and maintenance of this asset would be. But um, for now, yeah, the, the empty conduit would be owned by the city. Okay, uh, additional questions, Carol? Um, it seems that district energy microgrids are aspirational right now. It's it, what what needs to happen to make them more feasible and actually be able to create them. So there's several challenges. One of them is the regulatory context and um, being able to uh, understand how electricity can be distributed um, between different building owners. So that's also on the regulatory side, which um, relies on what's going to happen at the state level and the federal level on a lot of these um, uh, policies and, and regulations. Uh, on the uh, sort of more ownership of the, of the building side, the challenge continues to be understanding how developers can set up their real estate structures to still have the buildings be able to have individual um, ownership structures, even if one developer owns several buildings, each of those is likely going to have a different set of investors and therefore needs to have a separate LLC. That continues to be a challenge and we're actively working with the projects going through this part of the policy to try to understand what is possible, what's in their hands, what would be possible in their hands, and what are things that, um, again, rely just on the regulatory changes that we need to, to see and that we will be seeing in the coming years. So. Um, Part of that review process is for us to learn and understand what what are things that are in that in sort of on that front of, of development real estate, and from that process, if there's anything that we could be doing um, as as the municipal government to help on that front, um, that's sort of one of the things that's that's going to be coming out of the, of this policy. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further questions from the board? Well, thank you, Manuel, for a very um, thorough, jam-packed, like, um, uh, fast and detailed and great, great slides. And I, I knew kind of where to look, good use of animation. Um, you, you fit a lot in there um, in the short amount of time. So really appreciate your efforts on this. Um, okay, so um, I think a motion is in order here. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller, you're on mute. You're still on mute. I have to hear you. <laughs> aye. Okay. And the chair votes that. The motion passes. Thank you. Item number seven. Request authorization to execute a grant agreement with the Boys and Girls Club of Boston Incorporated for public art installation at the Mattapan Teen Center to advertise and issue a call for artists to install three to four additional wall murals in Mattapan and to execute license agreements with the landowners for the additional wall murals. Rosa. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, and Madam Secretary. My name is Rosa Herrera de Andres. She, hers. I'm a senior planner and colleague for Plan Mattapan. I'm here before you today to request authorization for three items. The first one is to authorize the distribution of $8,000 to a grant agreement to the Boys and Girls Club of Boston for the installation of wall murals at the Mattapan Teen Center. The second is to authorize the, direction, the director of the VRA to execute three walls uh, three license agreements with the selected property owners of the walls in the Marapan neighborhood for the commission murals. And the third one is to advertise and issue a call for artists for the commission of three murals in Marapan and authorize the director to execute any and all documents, including but not limited to grant agreements with the selected artists. 
I will give a brief background about how this initiative fits within the planning work of Plan Marathon. There in the first slide, you can see the timeline on the work that has already been done. Plan Marathon started in the fall of 2018. The BPDA initiated a neighborhood-wide comprehensive planning initiative guided by Imagine Boston 2030. Plan Marathon will produce a framework which, aim, which aims to predictably shape the future of Marathon with emphasis, emphasis on implementing relevant goals from past planning. The Plan Marathon Public Art Project is a unique opportunity to deliver a short-term implementation item by supporting the creation of temporary public art in the Marathon neighborhood. BPDA planning staff has worked with the community to identify four potential locations to install large-scale semi-permanent wall murals. The first installation will be located at the Marapan Teen Center at 10 Hasselton Street. The other three wall murals will be commissioned on private properties. Next slide, please. The Plan Marapan Public Art Project will complement the community's values as well as the Plan Marapan Vision Statement, which was co-written with the Marapan community during the first half of the planning process. The vision statement reads, Plan Marapan will strengthen the existing culture and stability of the community by supporting affordable housing, creating opportunities for businesses to thrive, and enhancing connections to improve the neighborhood's experience, accessing jobs and spaces where people gather. Last slide, please. Now I will talk about the Marapan Teen Center wall murals. And my last part is about the three other murals. The Marapan BPDA, the BPDA sorry, is seeking to distribute $8,000 through a grant agreement to support the public awareness of the arts and create temporary wall murals at the Marapan Teen Center. The Boys and Girls Club of Boston operates the Marapan Teen Center and was identified as a recipient of the funds because of their past experience conducting youth programs in the, in the neighborhood. And lastly, I will talk about the corporates for the three wall murals. The remaining Plan Marapan Public Art Project budget of $67,000 will be used for three additional large-scale exterior murals located, located elsewhere in Marapan. In the map, you see the orange dots, that's where the locations are. BPDA staff is currently working on establishing license agreements with the owners of the three private properties. The call for artists will be issued during 2020, and BPDA staff anticipates selection of the artists commissioned to produce the murals during the spring of 2021. The artists shall be paid directly by the BPDA using the above mentioned budget assigned for this project. The call for artists will follow the recommendations of the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, who will be partnering with the BPDA in this project. Following the recommendations, an artist selection committee of five to seven members composed of local artists, the property owners and residents will review the application and select the finalists to be interviewed. Once the artists are selected, we are committed to updating the board. Thank you. And please let me know if you have any questions. Great, thank you, Rosa. Uh, do we have any questions uh, or comments from the board? I have one question. Uh, the selection process seems uh, uh, very open and fair. Um, I, I do wonder how we will communicate when these uh, temporary or semi-permanent murals are uh, erected that they are, may not be permanent. Uh, we've, we've had uh, some questions about uh, temporary murals that the community fell in love with, in part because they helped to select them. And uh, if, if it turns out that um, they have to come down because we're building affordable housing there, how will we communicate before the fact that uh, they may not be permanent? Thank you, Dr. Landsmark. That's a question actually that the private property owners have also asked us when we have reached and um, uh, talked to them is a matter of having a conversation. This project is going to include public meetings with uh, key stakeholders. And also the description of the, of the project, maybe on the BPDA website, can have that clause. Obviously, there will be a point that if the mural stays longer, like 
that process, imagine that, because the commitment is only a year that the private property owners re are required to keep the mural. They are committed for one year as the standard that the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture has. Um, the BPDA in the case that an example of how we can approach it is to, if that case arises that the mural will be covered or destroyed, we um, can engage in conversations with key stakeholders in Marathon, such as the Greater Marathon Neighborhood Council and other groups. Well, I guess the one thing I would hope for, uh, not only here, but with um, other efforts that we've made to uh, beautify sites with um, uh, uh, murals that reflect current culture, is that um, either adjacent to or, or somewhere near the mural, I think it would be helpful if we could uh, also erect some signage or something uh, that would give the community an ongoing sense of what the long-term intention um, is for that particular site um, so that we uh, have an aesthetically pleasing object, but also one uh, that serves an educational purpose in terms of how the community is evolving. That's a great suggestion. We will definitely consider it. Thank you. Yeah, and and just kind of along those lines. I mean, I think these, um, you know, these, you know, people feel art very deeply. You know, and um, and and it's it's no wonder that they get connected when they start to see themselves in in art. And I wonder if you can, um, you know, possibly discuss saving portions of them and and putting them on display somewhere else, or just finding a way to, you know, when they're built. Um, have, have some of them to actually stay maintained in, in some way, shape, or form, um, or find a way to memorialize like what what was there, you know, um, maybe in the new building or something like that. Just uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, any further questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, item number eight, request authorization to execute rent deferment agreements with BRA tenants impacted by COVID-19. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is the exact same presentation I did for EDIC, which I'm happy to repeat for the public record if you would like, but I'll take your lead. Um, I do not think that is necessary unless we have a board member. Any further questions came up between them? No. Um, I think a motion is in order. Yeah, a oh, motion is in order. Let me not think. <laughs> motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Item number nine, request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals for environmental assessment for the resilient Fort Point Channel infrastructure project. Joe. Good afternoon, Chair Rojas, Director Golden, Secretary Pulumis, members of the board. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Joe Cristo. I'm a senior resilience and waterfront planner on the climate change and environmental planning team in the planning division. Thank you for the opportunity to present to the board this afternoon. Uh, I'm here to request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals to hire a consultant to assist with an environmental assessment for the resilient four point channel infrastructure project. I have a few slides that I will review towards the end of my presentation. Uh, the BPDA climate change and environmental planning team works in close partnership with the city of Boston environment department and other partners to collaboratively lead climate ready Boston program and produce neighborhood specific plans on coastal resilient solutions. <coughs> These plans present an assessment of risk and recommend detailed approaches to help make the city more resilient to climate change, especially sea level rise and coastal storms. They're not meant to sit on shelves and get dusty. They are the to-do list for our team's work. In the Coastal Resilience Solutions for South Boston report released in 2018, the top priority project recommended was a green infrastructure project, a 2300 foot uh, linear foot berm and seawall system along the East Bank Fort Point Channel. In January 2019, based on the recommendations in that report, 
our team in the Environment Department, in collaboration with the Massachusetts Environmental Management, sorry, Emergency Management Agency, submitted a grant application to FEMA's pre-disaster mitigation program for $10 million, half of the overall $20 million project cost. The FEMA pre-disaster mitigation program helps municipalities plan and implement hazard mitigation projects to enhance resilience. The city's budget department has contributed the other $10 million as matching funds as part of Mayor Walsh's commitment that at least 10% of the capital budget go towards funding resilience projects. In June 2019, um, uh, five months after the application was initially submitted, the project was identified for further review by FEMA, indicating that it is a finalist for funding. In August 2020, uh, following many meetings and requests for information, FEMA informed the BPDA and the city that the project can move to its next major milestone, an environmental assessment. Environmental assessments and associated documents are generated to fulfill the requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. They are used to determine if significant environmental impacts would occur as a result of a FEMA action or a FEMA-funded action and serve as a concise public document that serves to provide sufficient evidence and analysis regarding the significance of environmental impacts of the proposed action and alternatives to that proposal to aid in decision making when there is an unresolved conflict in the use of resources. This is the last major milestone before a formal notification of award from FEMA. So we are requesting authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals to hire a consultant to assist with the environmental assessment for this project. As I mentioned before, I have a few slides that show the project area where the environmental assessment will be conducted, as well as details on the conceptual project design. Next slide. This is just a brief uh, overview of the project itself, um, the project purpose, uh, as well as um, the timeline that I had uh, covered before in my presentation. And you see the highlighted area um, where the project will be uh, primarily benefiting. Um, however, it also protects um, adjacent neighborhoods um, in other parts of South Boston, as well as um, even Chinatown on the South End. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, uh, a look at the flood hazard pathways that may affect the project area, um, which we uh, had from Climate Ready Boston and Coastal Resilience Solutions for South Boston, but analyzed even further throughout this application process to make sure we're designing the best possible approach. Next slide. Um, this is just a, a screenshot from Climate Ready Boston that shows uh, different resilience initiatives uh, throughout the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the uh, plan view of the um, uh, design of the proposed berm. Um, so you have segment one that is an, an actual berm uh, about, about 40 feet wide, um, uh, approximately five to six feet high. Um, that transitions at segment two to a uh, seawall and elevated harbor walk, um, primarily because of the proximity to the Gillette manufacturing facility, uh, and then transitions back to the berm in segment three, um, the terminating at Dorchester Avenue. Uh, next slide, please. This is a conceptual uh, rendering from uh, Coastal Resilience Solutions for South Boston. Um, we have made some slight uh, design changes since then and, and will continue to as the project moves um, into further design, but this is a general idea of, of what we're hoping to achieve um, in the sections that are uh, the berm. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a quick preliminary drawing of that berm as well. Uh, you see it, it matches up, although the orientation is switched um, from the rendering. And next slide, please. And then here is a similar drawing for that segment two seawall section. Next slide. That's all I have, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Questions from the board? Yes. Uh, well, so is, is there any benefit to dredging or to um, increase the, the hold capacity in Fort Point Channel? Is that an option at all? 
you know, Coastal Resilient Solutions for South Boston uh, looked at um, the potential for uh, implementing uh, gates and, and using it more as a, a holding area and, and really recommended this approach as opposed to that. Um, I think that's something that can be studied further in the future. But as we implement this project and work in close collaboration with the open space plan for the neighborhood that I'm also leading, that um, I've presented to, to this board before on uh, in collaboration with Sasaki, as well as the two ongoing developments um, at uh, 15 Neko Street and 244 uh, to 248 um, A Street. Uh, the potential to retain stormwater through those projects and this one, I think, will really benefit the neighborhood as a whole. The neighborhood as a whole. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I um, did some work uh, for FEMA this past summer, and uh, I know how difficult it is to um, move a project to this stage um, for. Um, pre-disaster planning and implementation. Um, and I want to commend the staff for the work that you put into uh, bringing the project to this point. Uh, this is the kind of work which can potentially employ a lot of Boston workers. And I hope that um, as we move forward and this goes out uh, for bid once it's been approved, um, that uh, there's a, a very uh, concerted effort made to uh, put a lot of Boston workers to work on this project, but I think you've done a, a terrific job of moving it to this point. Thank you very much, Dr. Landsmark, and, and that will certainly be a priority um, uh, once we are able to start um, releasing uh, requests for proposals for the actual design and construction. Great. Any additional questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. I moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Burhan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 10, request authorization to advertise an issue and invitation for bids pursuant to MGLC.149 from qualified general construction contractors for basement waterproofing and related repairs at the China Trade Building located at 2 Boylston Street, Boston. William. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good afternoon. My name is William Epperson, Deputy Director for Capital Construction within the Real Estate Department. I am here before you today to request authorization to advertise and issue an invitation for bids pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 149 to procure a general building contractor for the basement waterproofing project for the China Trade Building, which is located at the intersection of Washington and Boylston Streets in Chinatown neighborhood. This matter was last before you in June of this year for authorization to enter into a design contract with Bargman Hendry Plus Architect, the architect for this project. As you may recall, the vacant basement of the China Trade Building requires waterproofing and related repairs in order to allow Fenway Community Health Center to perform a tenant fit out of the space in accordance with lease terms that the board authorized August of this year. The work includes replacement of the public sidewalk along Washington Street to allow for the installation of a horizontal waterproofing membrane underneath. Below, the brick foundation wall in the basement area way will be repointed and a vertical waterproofing system will be installed along with the French drain and sump pump to discharge any water infiltration. Finally, minor repairs and improvements will be made to the areaway structural system that supports the building and the sidewalk above. The bid package has been prepared by the architect and will be advertised following the Commonwealth of Massachusetts requirements under Massachusetts General Law Chapter 149, which governs procurement for building construction. This opportunity will also be posted on the BPDA website, bulletin boards, the Boston Herald, the state's combi system, marketed with MBE and WBE firms and various online trade publications. The construction contract will be awarded to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder after being brought back before the board for approval. The work is estimated at $390,000 and included in the fiscal year 21 capital budget. We anticipate returning to the board with an award recommendation in December of this year. 
Therefore, we are requesting that the secretary be authorized to advertise and issue an invitation for bids from qualified general contractors for this project. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? A quick question, William. What's the architect of the engineer's life expectancy of this membrane? Uh, at least 30 years. Uh, primarily, the, the membrane that will be installed under the sidewalk uh, is the one that is going to provide the majority of the waterproofing uh, for the system. And it will have a longer lifespan, being that it will be encapsulated under the concrete sidewalk. As a matter of precaution, we're installing the secondary vertical waterproofing on the brick wall. Um, we're not really seeing any water infiltration there, but it's mostly a matter of precaution to make sure that we don't have any additional infiltration into the basement since we are going to fit it out. So about 30 years for that vertical wall, longer for the horizontal sidewalk. Did they consider grouting? They did. They didn't like the idea of doing that to the brick masonry, um, but we do have some granite masonry around the corner. We are going to parge on that end of it, but we're not going to parge the, the brick. There they recommended to preserve uh, that red brick. That's where they wanted to do the, 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 the insulation panels down to a, a trench tray instead. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Any further questions or comments from the board? Hearing and saying none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes up. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Item number 11, request authorization to advertise and issue an invitation for bids pursuant to MGLC 30B for snow clearance on BRA owned properties citywide. And we have Laura? No, I'm covering this one for okay. so, Sorry, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm Devin Quirk, Director of Real Estate. This vote is for the very simple but very important matter of requesting your authorization to advertise an issue an invitation for bids for snow clearance on BRA owned uh, property citywide. We already have a contract in place for EIC properties. The term of the contract will be one year with one uh, with two one year options to renew. The contract value is not anticipated to exceed a quarter million dollars per year, although our actual spend is often less based on weather conditions. So I'd also appreciate the board support in just skipping winter this year. For many reasons so thank you <laughs> happy to answer any questions all right any questions from the board okay hearing and seeing none a motion is in order so moved second okay, roll call for a vote ms downs aye mr monahan aye dr landsmark aye mr miller aye and the chair votes aye motion passes Thank you very much item number 12 request authorization to accept a grant in the amount <laughs> $300,000 from the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management and to advertise an issue and issue a request for proposals for the development of resilience design options for East Boston's waterfront. Chris. Great. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, Secretary Pohemis. Uh, I'm Chris Bush, uh, Assistant Deputy Director for Climate Change and Environmental Planning. Uh, this vote is to accept grant funding and issue an RFP for consultant services. Uh, this past September, uh, the BPDA was awarded a $300,000 grant from the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management's Coastal Resilience Grant Program uh, to assist in the development of design options for coastal flood protection measures along vulnerable areas of East Boston's waterfront. Um, this project will build off of the climate vulnerability analysis and resilience strategies developed through the 2016 uh, Climate Ready Boston Plan and subsequent uh, coastal resilient solutions for east boston report uh, next slide please uh, this is actually a rendering from the east boston report that really represents the community's vision for uh, coastal protection infrastructure really a, a high dry green line uh, consisting of open space uh, living shorelines and, and hardened infrastructure to protect uh, all of east boston comprehensively um, the Climate Ready initiatives have provided the technical analysis and the timing location of current future flood events and has developed conceptual designs for resilience informed by the stakeholders and residents of East Boston. Uh, this grant funding will advance design solutions to address two uh, near-term flood entry points around Carlton Wharf and Lewis Mall 
along East Boston's marginal street alignment. Next slide, please. And these focus areas you can see are circled in red. Um, the Climate Ready East Boston report prioritized implementation of flood protection measures at these locations. Um, under current flood conditions, public ways are flooded adjacent to these entry points. And by 2030, when we're expecting around nine inches of sea level rise, uh, they could connect into a flood pathway along East Boston Greenway uh, with the potential of flooding uh, much larger residential areas of East Boston and also impacting significant uh, public infrastructure. Um, this project will result in a more formal technical analysis of site conditions to determine the feasibility of flood mitigation infrastructure and develop specific design recommendations. Uh, the design options will be developed through a process that engages uh, affected property owners and East Boston residents. Um, it's also intended to serve as a design model for vulnerable shoreline areas in Boston's other waterfront neighborhoods. Um, with regard to funding and next steps, uh, the total grant amount is for 300,000. Um, the city of Boston and BPDA are providing uh, over a 25% grant match through city of Boston funds and BPDA in-kind planning services. Um, a consultant will be selected uh, based upon the RFP process and the future BPDA board approval, hopefully in December, uh, we'll be requesting um, authorization to enter into a contract with a selected consultant. Um, once we have a consultant on board, we must complete the project uh, by June 30, 2021, which is the state uh, grant funding uh, deadline. Uh, longer term, uh, we're looking into a uh, type of FEMA grant that Joe had referenced is working on the four point channel uh, to get to a uh, full build with these projects. I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, do we have any questions or comments from the board? I think there's been a good amount of community input in uh, planning uh, up to this point. It would be my um, great hope uh, that the RFP that goes out here would call for uh, continued long-term community engagement with this process because this is really an opportunity for um, a lot of residents in East Boston and elsewhere uh, to learn a lot about uh, resilience and um, uh, protecting uh, the, uh, the coast. And by the time this project is done, there'll be a number of East Boston residents who hopefully will have had an opportunity to work on the actual implementation uh, of whatever the plan is. So I, I would hope and expect that our RFP would um, emphasize uh, the need for um, continuing community engagement with this process. Yeah, there is most definitely an engagement component. And I think we've, we sort of framed it as a community design process. So I think the intent is um, to have the affected property owners residents in that area, um, you know, working with a design consultant team, a better understanding of, again, the opportunities, limitations with these locations and ensuring, you know, these the sort of dual solution concepts that have come up through Climate Ready that, you know, this is functioning to enhance habitat, access to and along the waterfront, um, you know, really functioning on a number of different levels that those, that those themes are brought forth through this next level of design. Thank you. Any further questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All right, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Ms. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, Welcome. Okay, item number 13, request authorization to adopt designer selection procedures pursuant to MGLC7C. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is the same matter as I presented uh, earlier this evening. Uh, does anybody on the board have any additional questions? Seeing and hearing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, Teresa, do you think we can squeeze in one more for the public hearing? Yes, I think we can. I think we can too. Let's do it. Item number 14. 
request authorization to extend the tentative designation of Madison Tropical LLC as the redeveloper of a portion of Parcel 10 of the Southwest Corridor Development Plan, known as Parcel 10B, and to authorize the extension of a temporary license agreement for Tropical Food International's continued use of Parcel 10B for parking. Dana. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden and Secretary of Polhemus. The focus of this action is related, as mentioned, to Parcel 10, which is the Madison Tropical Project. Again, the focus primarily is on the development team's work on Phase 3, which is the 2085 Washington Street Project. That project was originally approved to be approximately 54,000 square feet of commercial, but a notice of project change, as has re referenced earlier, was submitted in 2019 to change the program to, to be a mixed-use residential with a proposition of 70 rental units, 44 condo units, and approximately 2,000 square feet of community space. Currently, design review is underway, and the development team has focused primarily on making the site plan uh, correct and appropriate for the uh, collaboration, the existing tropical foods, which is still in business and doing quite well, and also to be in keeping with the design considerations and values that are in the Plan Nubian Square initiative, which is currently underway. Again, very good and appropriate progress has been made by Madison CDC, in addition to their partnership with Trinity Financial to further implement uh, the proposed phase three development. In addition to the work underway for design, the development team will be submitting a supplemental uh, materials based on staff guidance around design, as well as other techno technological and environmental issues that will be done in early November, and will proceed with additional public process and review. The development team has also submitted applications for uh, funding support through the, the city's Department of Neighborhood Development. It is expectation, as mentioned earlier, that we will continue with uh, appropriate public process working with the Roxburgh Strategic Plan Oversight Committee and the corresponding Project Review Committee Further regulatory work that will be underway throughout the next comp components of this extension include review through the Boston Civic Design Commission and preparation for eventual Article 80 approval and with uh, the appropriate work done by the development team, a recommendation for final designation at the appropriate time. It's the opinion of staff and the team working on the project that the extension being requested is appropriate at this time. I will conclude my remarks and acknowledge the presence of uh, Robert Pizzini, who's the Director of Real Estate for Madison CDC, in case there are any questions. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dana. Um, do we have any questions from the board? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Dana. Thanks very much. Okay, so we are right on the dot at 530. So we are going to skip forward to um, the public hearing. So that's item number 26 on the agenda. Okay, this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Article 80 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the proposed project at 401 Congress Street in the South Boston Waterfront as a development impact project. 401 Congress Street LLC proposes the construction of a new office and laboratory research and development building totaling approximately 518,500 square feet of gross floor area with approximately 115,000 square feet of new and fully accessible public realm space on the approximately 1.6 acre project site, which is owned by the Massachusetts Port Authority. This hearing was duly advertised on October 1st, 2020 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, if anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded uh, an opportunity to do so. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. If you are planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. 
This will signal to the staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And when I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone and your web webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. And at that time, we ask you that to please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any emailed testimony will be read aloud. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. Um, so we will now begin the uh, presentation, Ms. Kerr. Thank you, Madam Chair, and you'll have to excuse me. I'm having some technical difficulties with my webcam, um, despite my best efforts. So That's fine. I remember. You'll hear, you'll, you'll hear me, but you won't be able to see me. So, <laughs> uh, Good evening, Director Golden, again, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, members of the board. In November of 2018, the Massachusetts Port Authority designated a joint venture led by Boston Global Investors as the developer for two parcels of land known as Parcel A2 and the Triangle Parcel, which together total approximately 1.6 acres of land along Congress Street. 401 Congress Street LLC's proposal is an exciting one, which will bring approximately 207,000 square feet of lab and or research and development space and approximately 258,500 square feet of office space to Parcel A2 at a key junction of the South Boston waterfront, which has long been the challenge from both an infrastructure and planning perspective. As the board will soon see, the core lab research and development and office uses of the proposed project are thoughtfully supplemented by significant investments in the public realm on both parcel A2 and the triangle parcel, and the provision of both indoor and outdoor flexible spaces allowing for public and civic cultural uses. The proposed program before the board this evening is reflective of recent modifications in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Both the 401 Congress Street project notification form and subsequent draft project impact report spoke to an 18 story, 100% office building on parcel A2. The proponent filed a supplemental filing with the BPDA on September 18th, 2020, which proposed the inclusion of life science so and lab research and development uses in place of a portion of the proposed project previously contemplated for office uses. These revisions resulted in an approximately 55,000 square foot reduction to the building's floor area while preserving the design and height considerations which have been previously reviewed by BPDA staff, the community, the Impact Advisory Group, and the Boston Civic Design Commission. As proposed this evening, the 401 Congress Street project totals approximately 518,500 square feet of gross floor area across 17 stories on parcel A2. In connection with the supplemental filing, the BPDA hosted a joint Impact Advisory Group and public meeting at the end of September, where the proposed modifications were well received. BPDA staff review concluded that there were no additional adverse impacts in connection with the project modifications and that no further study was required. In closing, I would like to acknowledge District City Councilor Ed Flynn and State Senator Nick Collins, who have both submitted letters of support for this proposal before the board this evening. I'd also like to thank the members of the Impact Advisory Group for their thoughtful participation through this Article 80 review process. On behalf of BPDA staff, I'm pleased to recommend approval before the board this evening of the proposed 401 Congress Street project. We are joined by John Hines from Boston Global Investors and Victor Vizgades from Sasaki, who will provide additional information and details on the project. Eliza Tan from Massport is also with us this evening. BPDA staff and the development team will be happy to answer any questions the board may have at the conclusion of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Are we up now? I'm sorry. I'm. Uh... Yes, you are, John. So I think if you guys just want to give um, our staff a cue, they'll be able to move through the slide deck and you guys can narrate. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ashling. Thank you, Director Golden, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, members of the board, and all other members of the public. And of course, our development team uh, who are alongside us to support us tonight. We really are quite proud of the project that we're presenting at long last and after a great collaborative effort with the BPDA, Massport, several state agencies, and alongside our IAG and feedback from the community in which we are working. Um, this project uh, has been a long road, but we are at last um, on the cusp of, of moving forward with a class A commercial project that is about 
450,000 gross square feet in terms of GFA. Um, we have a heavy emphasis on our public realm improvements, which we hope uh, you find agreeable in the presentation this evening. Um, and we have also made every effort uh, to make this project accessible to the public, inclusive to all demographics through the life cycle of the development, from ownership and financing to design and construction, and all the way through operations after construction is complete. And we've also endeavored to make this project as responsible as possible with respect to its social and environmental impacts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, We'll move forward, Victor. We'll uh, we'll get you through the the images. If you go to the next slide, please. Again, um, so at a very high level, just to orient the audience here, we are hovering above Summer Street, looking towards Boston Harbor, and you see on the right the uh, semicircular parking lot is Massport's parcel A2. It's just over an acre in size. And to the left, you'll see this triangular shaped parcel that is creatively referred to as the triangle parcel, um, which we have adopted as, as a, an additional area of, of improvements for this development. Um, it was not part of the initial RFP from Massport, but this development team has taken it upon itself to uh, improve that underutilized space as well. Um, and, and all the text on the left side of the page here will be um, explained in further detail through the imagery that Victor will get into in a few moments. Next slide, please. Um, as I said at long last, we're excited to be here tonight. We hope you view this project favorably. Um, in July of last year, 2019, we filed our PNF with the BPDA and went through a series of public meetings and BCDC presentations through the fall of 2019. Um, issued, we were issued our scoping determination in early 2020, filed our DPIR in February of 2020, and uh, we were subsequently put on hold along with everybody else through the COVID shutdown. But we're excited and grateful that the BPDA um, has reactivated its, its public engagement since June. Um, in August, we received BCDC approval on the design we had a public meeting as recently as the end of September, and we look forward to a positive vote tonight in order to start construction um, sometime in, in 2021, hopefully as soon as, as June or July. Uh, and the construction period is just under uh, two and a half years. So with that, I'll turn it over to Victor Vizgatis, my friend at Sasaki. Thanks, John. If you go to the next slide, please. I will try to move through this overview pretty quickly for everybody. Um, you know, as John said, the, the program of the tower of this building is an office and lab building, but fundamentally, this project is about the public realm. So here we are standing down on Congress Street, just near the B Street intersection, looking back at the tower, and you can see the arched forms uh, at the base. It's because this building is conceived of as a portal between levels of the seaport, a place for the public to connect, a place for the public to move through, and a place for the public to occupy even more so than the tenants of the building. If you go to the next slide, as we move inside into what we've called the Great Hall, the entire ground level, really the entire two ground levels because this connects World Trade Center Ave and, C and uh, Congress Street, um, is conceived as a public open space, 24 seven access for everybody all the time, uh, really meant to be an event space, a gathering space, a staying space, uh, a place that is not traditional retail, uh, but that is meant to occupy and serve the public. Go to the next slide. As we move up between these levels, because as I said, this is meant to be a connector uh, between these different these different seaport levels uh, to the mezzanine space, which is really occupied by a cultural tenant to help activate the space uh, and again to to serve the public. This space is connected by a grand stair, a series of escalators, as well as a 24/7 public elevator between all the levels. If we move up one more level up to the next slide, please. Um, we actually get to uh, a, a space that is found in one of the corners beyond just the Great Hall, but is a 150 seat auditorium that is serving both the tenants of the building, but also the community at large. We really see this as being used in the evenings and on the weekends by the community as performance space, as presentation space, as event space, as a great way of helping to activate the public realm. If you go to the next slide, 
this space really looks out onto a newly reconceived and activated World Trade Center Avenue. So we're now on World Trade Center Ave. Uh, the new Gables residential building is directly behind us, as well as the elevator to the Silver Line T station. Uh, looking back at the entrance to the building and the auditorium is there in the far corner. If you go to the next slide, we're still on World Trade Center app. Now looking back at the building, the BCEC is behind us. Um, and just to the on the left of this image is the new walkway to the triangle parcel that John began to mention. Really conceived of as a new outdoor public open space for everybody. If you go to the next slide, uh, we've now walked across uh, essentially across that bridge, we're floating about 20, 20 feet above this bridge that crosses over the off ramp from the highway, looking down onto the landscape of this triangle, uh, new outdoor space, the tower is immediately to our right. But again, trying to create a landscape here that is really unlike anything in the seaport and unlike most of what is in Boston. We really want this to be lush, occupiable, a great space for people to come and to reimagine what this area could be. As we move down that uh, series of ramps, if you go to the next slide, we arrive back at the Congress Street and B Street intersection, looking back up onto the triangle parcel here, the tower is just off to the left. And this space is not only what happens on top of the triangle, but what happens below the triangle. So if we move to the left where the gentleman with the camera uh, is, is walking, if you go to the next slide, please, we arrive at a space on the underside here that is large scale, roughly 25 feet in height, um, meant to be flexible public open program. Uh, the goal here is to allow it to be ever changing, to explore new possible events. Um, all of this programming will be handled by the building. Uh, and so the goal is to keep it always lively and active. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and then finally, for an image of view from uh, Summer Street, from the Convention Center, looking back. And so you see the tower itself, as well as that new bridge that is connecting the World Trade Center app back to the triangle parcel, both the upper, above side and the below side. Next slide. And just to get into a little bit more of the technical details, as John mentioned, this is a combination lab uh, and office building. You can see how we've distributed the program. Uh, above all of that 117,000 square feet of public uh, amenity space that is happening on both the ground levels and the outdoor space. Next slide. Uh, John already talked about the numbers here, so I won't get into that, but this is here for your reference. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. And just so you understand all those images that we just showed, uh, should be the, the slides are a little messed up here, but uh, everything that you see in yellow and purple here uh, on the ground floor of the Great Hall space is basically public program. Everything that's yellow is open. The purple is really the food service area that is supporting this. Uh, the green and the gray is sort of the back of house that we've raised up above uh, any potential flood levels to make sure that the building is fully resilient and survivable. You know, the next slide, you can see then how this sits on the broader site, World Trade Center Ave is to the right. Uh, you can see where the Pike and Congress Street are as well as the off ramp and the on ramp and that triangle open space that sits below the landscape level of the triangle as this functional programmable outdoor area. Next slide. If we go up one more level, we're now at the World Trade Center Ave level. So you can see the intent here very much is to create a continuity of outdoor public realm experience between this newly envisioned World Trade Center Ave, the bridge that extends across to the triangle, the triangle itself that ramps back down to Congress Street, and that actually the inside of that tower space underneath those four grand arches in this great hall is a really a continuation of that public realm itself. It's all one surface that flows between the multiple levels to connect the public to foster movement and to really, as I said, create a gateway at this point in the seaport. Next slide. So we go up to just one more floor. We're now one level above World Trade Center Ave. Uh, this is where the lab program begins, but what you see in yellow is that auditorium and pre-function space that I mentioned. This is part building amenity and part uh, community amenity to be used for broader events. Next slide. I'm going to skip all the floors in between and get up to the top level because one of the goals here was to make sure that any mechanical equipment that we're housing on the roof is not seen by anybody at street level. Everything is recessed into the building height. There are no penthouses that stick up above the parapet. Uh, everything that you've seen in the renderings is accurate. We have pushed all the mechanical down into the top floor. And so what you see in the orange color around the perimeter is actually what's left for occupiable space 
which we've then sort of turned into a building amenity fitness center running and walking track so that that top floor will always be active and energized um, as it is perceived from the street level below. Next slide, please. So you can get a sense of what that might look like here. And if you go one more, uh, another view of that, we really think this has the opportunity to, to, to be a great environment to foster some of the sustainability missions of the building as well. Next slide. And just so you can see, uh, this has really been planned out with actually equipment pieces uh, to make sure that this is workable, that this can be achieved in the heights that we have. And if you go to the, the next slide, uh, to really make sure that we are also realizing potential for solar on the roof, which you see in the blue hatched area, we continue to investigate how to squeeze that even more. Uh, but this is all done with a sense of what is really going to be achievable. And I think if we go to one more slide, uh, we have the final sort of aerial rendering of the building. So you can see how that all works. All the mechanical equipment is pushed again, as I said, into that mass of the building. And really most importantly, the reconceived public realm uh, that connects World Trade Center level down to the new Congress Street intersection. And one more, I think that brings us back to the uh, summary slide. So thank you very much. Okay, so does that uh, conclude your presentation? It does, yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, all right, so uh, now we are moving on to the public testimony portion of um, this agenda item. So um, as directed uh, earlier, um, if you would like to comment, um, please indicate so by um, clicking that raise hand icon and we can start, uh, start taking comments. Okay, uh, Gary Walker, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the board, um, uh, Secretary Polimus and uh, Director Golden, Gary Walker, Electrical Workers, Local 103, just like to speak in strong support. It's a uh, beautiful building, and we'd like to thank um, the Hines, uh, John Hines and his, and his group for uh, their continued support of our membership through the jobs they provide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Finer Perez, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. My address representing the Carpenters Union. It is with great pleasure I'd like to go in support of this break on behalf of hundreds of union carpenters that live and work for the city of Boston. Okay, thank you, Minor. Um, do we have anyone else who would like to comment? If so, please uh, click on the raise hand icon. Um, nope. I don't see anybody else, Madam Chair. All right, so um, so now we will move on to um, board member questions. So do we have any questions um, or comments from the board? I've got one uh, comment. Could we go back to the um, uh, ground floor floor plan just for a moment? I think you passed it. No, it was, it was there. You go. Right. Um, it appears that you have um, a pretty significant number of uh, restrooms here, and I point to this because this board recently approved uh, another project um, in the Seaport area. Uh, that also um, speaks in terms of becoming a, uh, a public space, a uh, significant public space. Um, and my recollection is that they had something like uh, one men's room and one woman's room um, on the entire ground floor. Um, and it looks as though you have designed a space here that recognizes that a 24-7 uh, public space um, is going to need more than uh, one restroom uh, for each gender. Um, and this may be a small thing, but I, I suspect we're going to have uh, a few more developers who will come in um, with public amenities uh, and a desire to open up uh, ground floor spaces, uh, particularly when it's cold and in the winter. 
Um, and, and I point to this as, uh, from my perspective, exemplary um, in terms of what an indoor public space needs if it really is going to succeed um, as, as uh, an attractive space uh, for the public um, at all hours of the day and night. Uh, so I commend you on that. Um, and I hope that other uh, designers will um, also look to this as, as a model. Um, and I think that in an overall sense, you've taken this site and the triangular site um, and really um, given us something that is, uh, is inspiring and uh, a bit non-traditional for uh, what we've seen uh, on, the, um, uh, on the seaport. Um, and I thank you for um, looking at this in a way that really recognizes that a public space should look and feel and function uh, like a real public space. Thank you. It's been absolutely the intent, and I think that was BGI's goal, is to push something here that feels welcoming, feels like everybody should come here and, and be here, not just pass through here, but actually exist here. Thank you very much, Dr. Landsmark. It is uh, incredibly, um, it, it is, it is my young career's crowning achievement to have uh, anything be called inspiring. Uh, from a figure such as yourself. So thank you very much. And, and hats off to the Sasaki team for how seriously and thoughtfully they approached the public realm um, and to Massport uh, for holding us to task as well throughout the RFP process um, and the BPDA staff as well. This has been, as I said before, a truly collaborative and, uh, and really great process, long though it has been. Okay, any additional questions or comments from the board? Uh, Brian, um, Mr. Miller, you're on mute. Yes, uh, just a comment on the public space. I really like what I see and it and appears to be very generous. And that, uh, knowing that area pretty well, difficult, the parcels were unusually shaped and the different levels there. So I just want to commend you on, on working within those parameters and, and coming up with such a creative plan. So I like what I see. Thank, Thank you. you. And what was not captured, I think, in the presentation adequately, but the architects and our structural and geotechnical engineers also had to uh, contend with the MBTA Silverline Tunnel running beneath the site as well. So um, very happy with the outcome. Excellent. Great. Any additional questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, we'll do a roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, great. So let's see the time. Yep, it's uh, 5.55. So we can go ahead and move on with the next public hearing. Um, so we are on agenda item number 27. This is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as a Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Article 80 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the amended and restated master plan for plan development area number 87 Boston Landing and conforming amendments to development plans of four proposed projects within Boston Landing in the Brighton neighborhood of Boston. This hearing was duly advertised on October 1st, 2020 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity to do so. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. And if you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. 
you must unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please kindly conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. And Ms. Hines will now begin the presentation. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hamas and Director Golden. As you know, the Boston Landing Project and Associated PDA were originally approved by this board in 2012 and have been amended multiple times in the subsequent years. The PDA contains five projects along Guest Street and Brayton, including the New Balance World Headquarters, the Office Building Sports Project, the Hotel Project, the Sports Facility Project, and the Residential Project. Once again, we are before you to request minor modifications. Since the master plan had been previously amended seven times though, the BPDA staff requested that the proponent submit an amended and restated master plan this time in order to incorporate all of the previous amendments along with those before you this evening, which include adding additional retail uses, adding 30,000 square feet of retail square footage, adding uses to the open space, updating the site plan and adding language to allow for flexibility to move the parking spaces within the projects at Boston Landing around as long as the maximum permitted number of spaces for the overall project, which is 1900, um, is not exceeded. The amended and restated master plan, the conforming development plans, and the corresponding notice of project change were all submitted to the BPDA by Boston Landing LLC on August 7th, 2020. An impact advisory group meeting and a public meeting were held via Zoom on September 9th to discuss the amendments, and the comment period ended on September 21st. The BPDA received letters of support from, for the amendments from the Impact Advisory Group and a joint letter from Councillor Liz Brearden, Representative Kevin Honan, and Representative Mike Moran. At this point, I'd like to hand it off to Keith Craig from NB Development Group to give a brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, Secretary Paul Hamas. Uh, again, Keith Craig with NB Development Group, uh, proponent. Um, and developer of, of Boston Landing. Um, uh, next slide, please. So as, as Casey said, um, you know, we've submitted an amended and restated master plan as well as four conforming development plans. Um, so, you know, simply with these submissions, we're not um, proposing any project. We're simply trying to bring current and make consistent our master plan and all of the development plans um, and we thought um, that this was a good thing to do um, this year, given um, the, the current uh, world we all live in and, and try to successfully tee us up next year um, to continue on at Boston Landing with both development, um, but most specifically, we are very concerned about the retail and restaurant environment. As we know, um, uh, as we come out of this uh, next year, uh, retail and restaurant, um, in the city will not look anything like it does uh, before COVID. Um, so um, next slide, please. So as uh, Casey highlighted here, what we are doing is just trying to um, clean up much of our master plan, um, specifically focused on retail, and then also uh, allowing um, uh, activation of some of our outdoor spaces uh, a little bit better than that what we've been able to do in the past um, and correcting a couple things um, uh, such as uh, the um, NB headquarters and the hotel uh, PDA line um, to clarify what's actually been built um, as opposed to what was drawn on a plan you know back in 2012 and then lastly trying to um, just uh, realign some of our uh, parking and project square footages as to what is now um, built at Boston Landing. Um, and because because of that, because much of Boston Landing has been built out, this this reallocation is, is very modest um, and it's just trying to, again, make the master plan and development plans uh, be consistent with each other. Uh, next slide, please. So just to be to be really clear, what um, our amended and restated master plan and our four development plan amendments 
Um, what they do not do is they're not increasing any already approved development square footage, except for that 30,000 square feet of additional retail um, to help um, activate our streetscape and to align better with um, what's planned and proposed in our master plan and development plans. Um, they do not increase any already approved parking spaces. Um, they do not add any uh, new uses to the project other than elaborating on those retail and restaurant and open space uses. Um, we are not increasing the site's FAR. We are not um, proposing any um, uh, new project impacts and we are not uh, changing any of the already approved building heights. Next slide, please. Um, so it, just really quickly, um, if I could just uh, go through Boston Landing just to remind everybody what has been complete uh, completed since 2012. Um, obviously, this is the site down in uh, Guest Street and also Brighton. Next slide, please. Our first project uh, was the New Balance headquarters shown here. This was finished in September of 2015. Also in the foreground, you can see the Boston Landing commuter rail station, um, which we uh, developed uh, in partnership with MassDOT and the MBTA, and that was open to the public in May of 2017. Next slide, please. Uh, Warrior Ice Arena and 80 Guest Street. Um, this was a project um, that we obviously worked with in collaboration with the Boston Bruins and the city. Uh, th these two buildings were open in September of 2016. Next slide, please. Uh, the Auerbach Center, home to the Boston Celtics, as well as 40 Guest Street, um, which is home to Smart Labs. Um, this is a project that was completed in uh, September of 2018. Next slide, please. Uh, Lanterra residential, um, uh, residential apartments, uh, two, uh, 295 units. This was also completed in 2018. Next slide. And then lastly, uh, our current project under construction, um, obviously slightly impacted um, because of COVID. Um, uh, we are one year into, into this construction. Um, this is a final rendering uh, and next slide. And here's our current uh, image of, of that building. Um, what was envisioned to be a September of 2021 completion has now been pushed to uh, March of 2022. Uh, so unfortunately we missed the, uh, the 2021 track season, um, but um, uh, we still have uh, full construction cr crews on with obviously with COVID protocols, and we, we think we will achieve that March of 2022 opening. Uh, thank you, that was the conclusion of my presentation, and I'll turn it back over to Casey. That concludes our presentation, thank you. Okay, great. Um, and um, as this is a public hearing now, um, we will open it up to public testimony. So again, if um, you would like to, um, Give your testimony please click on the raise your hand button it will turn blue and a member of um, our team will will call on you okay gary walker go ahead and unmute yourself yes madam chair uh, members of the board uh, madam secretary uh, director golden once again gary walker electrical workers local 103 I'd like to speak in strong support and once again uh, thank the boston landing um, um, group for are continuing to uh, employ our members. It uh, does not go unnoticed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Soraya Hen Harley, I think it is. You can unmute yourself. Oh, no. Hi, my name is Soraya Harley, and I live in Rockbury, Mass. Um, <clears throat> and I'm also a UCB, which is Union Capital Boston. Remember? I'm here to support Building A and Building D. Building A will have 100 new affordable housing units at the Old Butler Yard in Nubian Square to help fight gentrification. Building D will have 50 seniors aging in places close to their family, friends, and doctor's offices. Building A will also create 50 permanent jobs in the Bunto State, in the community. Thank, 
Thank you. Does that, does that complete your comments? There are so many vacant apartments and buildings in the community that really needs to be fixed up and put out for people that are low income or even homeless and seniors as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ma'am, were you talking about Bartlett Yard Project? Yes, I was. I was talking about Bartlett and I'm talking about all the other places that are vacant and empty. Okay. Every last building, but I was first talking about Bartlett. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Minor Perez, can you unmute yourself? Go ahead, Minor. Thank you, Madam Secretary, Madam Chair, members of the board, Minor Perez, on behalf of the Carpenters Union, I want to go in support of this proposal. Thank you, Minor. Just a reminder, we are taking testimony right now for the Guest Street um, project. Are there any other hands? Are there, is there anybody else who would like to testify? Okay. Oh, hold on for one second. Reginald, unmute yourself. Good evening, everybody. My name is Reginald Brown, and I'm associated with New York Community Guide. And sir, I just want to say that sir, I'm sorry. We're not taking testimony yet for Bartlett for Bartlett Yard. This is on a guest guest street project in Brighton. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Is there any other testimony for the guest street project? <laughs> Madam Chair, there's no further testimony. Okay, great. Um, and uh, do we have any emails that, that uh, we received that need to be read into the record? No, no, ma'am. No? Okay, perfect. So um, uh, we'll move on to board questioning. Does anyone on the board have any questions or comments related to um, this agenda item? Okay, hearing and seeing none. A motion is in order. Moved. Second. A roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank so you. now we are going to move on to the, um, to the final public hearing that is on the agenda. Um, okay. So this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Article 80 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the second amended and restated master development plan for plan development area number 94 Bartlett Place and second amended and restated phase one development plan and the phase four development plan within such plan development area relating to the Bartlett Place Development Project located in Roxbury. This hearing was duly advertised on October 1st, 2020 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity to do so. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. If you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Um, click on the hand icon um, on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting, and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone. Your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. 
At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. Now, uh, Mr. Dana Whiteside um, can now begin the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, the Technical Human Dana Whiteside, Deputy Director for Economic Development with the BPDA, uh, would request respectfully request that uh, recommendation that this item be tabled for the moment. Okay. Um, and uh, Secretary Paul Humus will be, do we need a vote to table that? You need a, you need a motion. Oh, a vote. Yeah, a motion. Um, okay. Uh, I move that we, um, a motion is in order. I move that we table the Bartlett, Lar Bartlett Yard project. I second that motion. Okay. Uh, roll call um, for a vote. Uh, Ms. Downs? Aye. Uh, Ms. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. aye. So motion, so this agenda item is now tabled. Um, so we will move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Madam Chair, you may want to explain to the attendees that we're not going to take a presentation or a vote on this just okay. so that they understand yes. what it means. Yeah, so what the, so what that means of tabling the um, tabling the item means we're not going to hear the presentation. It will it will not be put up for a vote um, uh, to you know to approve the project. Um, it uh, looks like this is going to go back and, and be rescheduled for another meeting. Um, the next meeting will still um, when, whenever it is scheduled, be a public um, open hearing, um, and it'll work just like this. You'll have the opportunity to come, um, you know, do the same process, raise your hand. You have two minutes to um, to testify, you know, for or against, um, and and yeah, and that's the way the the process will work. But um, for today, this project is not being uh, voted on. Um, and we are tabling the agenda item to another meeting at a to be determined date. And that will be publicized, um, you know, at the BPTA website and, and in all the different channels that they, um, that they use to communicate that. So I appreciate everyone who's called in for this um, and, uh, you know, uh, hope you can come back again um, to, to have your voice heard um, when, when it does come or um, on the agenda again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, we're gonna move on to, back to where we left off previously in the agenda. And I believe, and keep me honest, Teresa, we were at uh, item number 15. That's correct. Yes. Request authorization to award final designation status to Mill Street Cooperative Incorporated for the sale of 15 Mill Street in Roxbury. Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are requesting board approval to award final designation to Mill Street Cooperative for the sale of 15 Mill Street in Roxbury. 15 Mill Street is a 3,000 square foot parcel on a narrow residential street. Since 1986, the BPDA has licensed this parcel to the Mill Street Cooperative for resident off-street parking. At a well-attended community meeting held in April 2019, neighbors expressed the desire for the parcel to remain off-street parking and not be considered for development. Accordingly, the BPDA issued an RFP on February 26, 2020, for the sale of 15 mills for permanent off-street parking for up to 10 vehicles. Mill Street Cooperative made the sole proposal for this RFP. Their proposal will maintain the premises as a parking lot and make improvements such as adding planters, new paving and drainage, and new striping. The cooperative is made up of a, of a diverse group of neighbors and as such, the sale will increase property ownership of people of color in the city. An appraisal commissioned by the BPDA in February 2020 valued the parcel at $90,000. The cooperative offered a price of $50,000, which is the parcel's appraised value, net previous rent payments, and the cost of the improvements made by the cooperative to date. 
Since the board approved final designation or tentative designation in July 2020, we have successfully negotiated the terms of a deed and land disposition agreement and approved the collaborative's plans for improvements. We're very happy to conclude the sale and transfer this parcel to local ownership, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. <clears throat> Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. <laughs> okay, um, Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Morgan. All right, item number 16, we have a certificate of completion. So request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the res residential project at 125 Guest Street within Boston Landing Plan Development Area number 87, located in the Brighton neighborhood of Boston in accordance with section, is that D2? Sorry, my toner. Section D2? Yes, D2. Okay. D2. Um, of the second amended and restated cooperation agreement uh, for Boston Landing. Um, so this is a certificate of completion. There's no presentation. Um, and Anita, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Okay, moving on to item number 17. Request authorization to issue a certi certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 16 compact living home ownership units, including two IDP units, 180 or 1,839 uh, square feet of commercial space 11 parking spaces and bicycle storage located at 472 West Broadway to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for zoning relief necessary and to take all related actions. Lance. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good to see you all. Uh, the project consists of um, uh, the construction of a five-story mixed-use development totaling 20, 21,000 plus square gross square feet. Uh, the proposed project will include, as you said, Madam Chair, um, 16 condominium units, uh, include two IDP units, and approximately 1,800 plus square feet in commercial retail space with 11 garage parking spaces. The developer also agreed to a $20,000 commitment to transit improvements in Perkins Square, which is directly across from the proposed project site. You're going to hear from um, architect Tim Johnson, who's going to give you a brief overview of the building design. And George Maranci, the project uh, council, is uh, here to answer any uh, any questions for the board members. And um, staff recommends that the board uh, take the appropriate actions necessary uh, to move this project forward. Thank you, Vince. Uh, this is Tim Johnson, architect. George, would you like me to, would you have anything to say, George, before I begin? Tim, you could just start on the presentation. George is just here to answer questions. All right, thank you, Lance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is Tim Johnson, the project architect. And this proposed project features a new five-story mixed-use building with garage on a 4,800 square foot lot through, through lot fronting both a neighborhood Main Street, West Broadway, and a neighborhood residential street, Athens Street. The project complies with the Compact Living Pilot or CLP program, whose purpose is to increase housing density with minimal parking within a 15 minute walk of multiple mode transit hubs. The proposed project consists of at grade, 1900 square foot commercial space, 11 car garage and bike storage. The upper floors, 14 CLP units, two affordable units and required shared spaces, all serviced by an elevator. The proposed five-story mixed-use building will add to the mix of emerging multi-story, multifamily housing and commercial spaces in and around Perkins Square. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The site is located in the vibrant Perkins Square area within a 15 minute walk of both Andrew and Broadway transit stations. Next slide, please. Multiple modes of transportation are available to businesses and residents in or around Perkins Square, including trains, buses, zip cars, bikes, foot, and private automobiles. Contextually, uh, next please. Contextually, the, five, the proposed five-story mixed-use building takes its design cues from the other mixed-use mixed use projects recently approved around Perkins Square. Buildings set back from the sidewalk several feet, multiple units facing the street, symbolized by bay windows, and either commercial space or garages at the ground floor. Next slide, please. This is a view of the site from Perkins Square along West Broadway. Next slide, please. This is a view of the site, which is a through lot from the Athens Street side. Next slide, please. This is the ground floor plan. West Broadway is on your right. Athens Street is on your left. Contextually, uh, the proposed building's interface with the public realm is experienced at either end of the through lot. At West Broadway, the building is set back two feet, increasing the sidewalk to 18 feet and dotted with street trees and benches. The project's commercial space faces this grand boulevard. At Athens Street, the building's first four floors are set back three feet, increasing the sidewalk to six feet, the minimum sidewalk width for street trees. The project's resident and garage entrances face this narrow one-way street. Next slide, please. The exterior finished materials proposed on the West Broadway side will be consistent with much of the older housing stock around Perkins Square. Brick veneer, bay windows with metal or wood panels, and accent metal roofing. The exterior finished materials proposed on the Athens Street side reflect a more industrial, streamlined aesthetic. Colorful, lightweight concrete panels, stacked brick patterns, and natural wood lap siding. Uh, exterior elevation studies will continue to be reviewed by the BPTA as the design process evolves. And that concludes my short presentation. Thank you. Any questions for the board? Yeah, Nance, that's my job. <laughs> Does that conclude your presentation? It does. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> yes, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? <laughs> Just a comment that I, I would like to see this building in, in a rendering that really shows it in context. Um, you've shown us context and you've shown us the building, but uh, and I'm not exactly sure of how it all fits together. It's just a comment. I mean, you, you have that white space there, and that white space is not really a white space. In fact, it's another building. Uh, yes, sir. We did submit um, 3D color contextual views. Um, they're just not part of the slideshow. Uh, if I could access my desktop, I could certainly call those up. I mean, I, I'm willing to accept this at, at this moment, but I think that um, as you come before us, um, it would be helpful to uh, see a, a somewhat more authentic rendering of what it's really going to look like uh, when, it's, when it's completed. It's not going to be a green space with a, a white mural on the side. Yes, sir. I, thank you, sir. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, maybe Lance, you can kind of um, get the other renderings uh, via email to the board, um, just so we can see that. At, you know, we'll make sure that happens, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions or comments from the board? I'd just like to add, uh, Dr. Landmark, that's uh, an excellent point uh, because it it really doesn't show um, in context. I did have some feedback. Some from, uh, from some neighbors on Athens Street 
about the size. There's a lot of single or maybe two family homes on Athens Street and they felt a bit overwhelmed. So I, I think moving from three feet to six feet was some concession, but th there was some um, negative feedback from some of the neighbors that I've heard directly. I'd just like to add that to the discussion. George, did you want to respond to that? Uh, it's my understanding that there was no opposition to this project. George Maranti. Lance, I don't think George is here. Okay. I believe it might have been resolved, but it, it was. Uh, it had to do with the scale of the building. So, just make note of that. Can anybody from the development team or Lance just give some context on kind of the scale of this building in relation to um, to those surrounding it? I would defer to Tim. Tim is the project architect. Tim. Uh, yes, thank you, Lance. Uh, I, uh, my apologies. Uh, we did have 3D contextual views. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I did not, they were not included in this presentation. Uh, this particular site, if we go back uh, to the beginning, please, uh, sh to show you where it's located. The, there, the one prior, uh, the other way, please. Right there, there. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, you can see uh, on the back of the uh, property, uh, this, the rear of Athens Street at this section of Athens uh, is a more uh, back of, of large buildings uh, context. Uh, the smaller um, single family homes are, are not in this vicinity, they're further down Athens toward um, Broadway Station. Uh, this is some of the older uh, commercial buildings, multi-story com commercial buildings. Uh, we did have several uh, abutters meetings. Um, uh, their concerns uh, were uh, roof decks, um, basically uh, uh, anything outdoors that would uh, transmit noise to their properties. That was the major issue we heard from them. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Um, any further questions or comments from the board? I, I have a suggestion for Tim. Tim, um, when you do do it, I think the building that's next to stats now, the, the development that's going up would help you in, in a sense of keeping it in, uh, I mean, that building is, that's a big building on the corner there that uh, next to stats now. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Martin. It is a, a five story building uh, yeah. as this is, uh, uh, and it would have been good to add that in the uh, presentation. Yeah, I think it would help you show that it isn't really out of context now. Hello, I'm, this is George Morancy. I'm sorry, I was having some difficulties. I was going in and out there. I did hear everything because I was connected. Uh, can everybody hear me now? Yes, George. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so I did hear Mr. Miller's uh, comments and I did hear uh, Tim's response and, and, and Mr. Monahan's. And that's exactly right. Um, this, I mean, th this is properly uh, viewed in respect that is a West Broadway building in the context of what's been happening on West Broadway. Yes, it has the same height and massing on the Athens Street side. Uh, but it is not inconsistent with exactly what is happening at 480. Uh, West Broadway, which admittedly does not extend all the way to Athens Street, and that's the form of Perkins Supply. Uh, it's uh, it's a building that is basically trying to extend, uh, uh, you know, the height, density, and massing along the West Broadway side, the Santander building. Uh, next to it is the Eastern Bank building, uh, which, you know, in the bird's eye view that we're looking at right now uh, is a two-story building. Uh, directly across from the site and from the Eastern Bank site is a parking lot. It's a, it's a, I guess the biggest parking lot in South Boston, not counting the Seaport District. Something will be happening there. I entirely agree that when something happens on that side of Athens Street, it should be appropriately scaled for the residential side 
of you know of the street of of, of South Boston and, and more appropriately in line with heights and massings on West Third Street and and again on 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 Athens Street. Uh, the Athens Street buildings are a bit farther down. Uh, I know that uh, the same concerns were expressed when uh, the Mez, which is the former Broadway Theater building, was developed. Uh, actually, the, the real concerns at that time, I think, were had to do with the roof decks and the uh, in the balconies that had originally been proposed for the Mez, uh, which were eliminated. Uh, as Tim mentioned uh, in response, when we had the abutters meeting on uh, on this project. And I believe it was in December. It was pre-COVID. Uh, um, you know, the the concerns were uh, uh, not to speak, and I and I know that the that the BRA has commentary letters, but the concerns of that meeting were not really the height, the massing. They were about, as Tim said, a roof deck, because uh, originally there had been a roof deck proposed. Uh, on the Athens Street side of the building. One of the changes that was made after community process was that it was moved to the other side of essentially the, uh, the vertical circulation corridor in the building, which extends to the roof and is a natural barrier in terms of a natural sound barrier. So it was eliminated, the, the roof deck that originally was on the Athens Street side uh, so that it's not there. It's on the other side of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the rooftop penthouse. Uh, I'm not saying that that you know concerns about height on Athens Street are not valid, um, you know. But when we did have the abutters meeting, it was mostly about uh, that roof deck space. Uh, so you know, it's not again looking at this bird's eye view. Uh, where this building is 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 not inconsistent with what happened at uh, 480 West Broadway. It's not inconsistent even with the Santander building. It is a bit above, and you know, it's probably in line what. Uh, with what will happen at the Eastern Bank building. I think that the consensus is that, you know, a, an appropriate height level on West Broadway is at least 45 feet. Uh, and virtually every lot on West Broadway is in, flat, is in fact a block through lot. They're run. We lost you, George. Uh, from design staff at the BBDA to make sure that the Athens Street side of the building, uh, you know, uh, relates to, uh, you know, the different urban design reality on that side of the building as opposed to the West Broadway side. Okay, thank you for those um, those responses. Um, does that sufficiently address your questions or do we have additional questions from the board follow up? I'm comfortable with uh, the comments. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, so if there are no additional comments um, or questions, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs. Aye. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Madam chair. Yeah, before we move on to um, to the next item, I just want to um, remind everyone who um, who is in attendance that um, item agenda item number 28 for planned development area number 94 Bartlett place um, has been tabled. So there will not be a vote on that project today. Uh, um, therefore, we will not have um, uh, an open testimony or or take any comments related to that project. Um, the project will be rescheduled for another date and will be duly advertised. And it will be in um, in this exact same form where you will be able to, to call in or um, join online like you um, have done today. And we will have that, that opportunity for you to raise your hand and everyone gets two minutes to speak. Um, so just wanted to, um, to clarify that as I see, we have a couple hands up and, and, um, and just remind everybody about that. So, but you're welcome to stay for the rest of this meeting. Um, but that, that project is not going to be, um, on the agenda today. Okay. So the next item on the agenda 
is item number 18. Request authorization to issue a certificate of a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 34 residential rental units, including four IDP units, 33 off-street parking spaces, and 33 bicycle storage uh, units uh, located at 249 Quarry Street to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for zoning relief and to take all related actions, Lance. Lance, you're on mute. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, Director Gold, and 249 Quarry Road project program consists of the construction of a four-story building, 34 rental uh, units above a below-ground parking garage for 33 vehicles with ample bicycle parking. Uh, there'll be new uh, landscaping, a courtyard, a patio, balconies, and a roof deck, uh, including um, traffic calming measures at the intersections of Jordan Road and Quarry Road. Um, this, just to give you a little context, this project sits right on the, um, the town line of Brookline. Um, there are also two other adjacent parcels associated with this project. Um, but uh, today we're talking about 249 Quarry Road. Um, most of what we heard at the public meet, the two public meetings that we had was um, just a brown traffic calming. This is a cut through road, Quarry Road. It comes from Chestnut Hill and Route 9, um, you know, and down to other parts of um, the Elster Brighton community. So with that said, um, you're gonna hear a presentation from Nettie John, who's the project architect, give you a brief overview. There were, um, for board members' questions, you'll hear from um, Joe Hanley to answer questions. He's on, the, um, He's on the call as well. Um, as for the traffic common, um, this is a $50,000 commitment. Um, we're working in collaboration with BTD. There's also uh, $10,000 for the Brian Honing Park, for the parks. And uh, just for the record, uh, the current board memo does not have this, but this is uh, just new and off the presses that there's also a commitment to $7,500 for the Joyce playground, which is near Union Square, um, for Parks and Recreation's um, maintenance. So with that said, um, you'll hear from Nettie. Thank you, Lance. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Nitty John. Uh, I'm a PC project architect at PCA and representing the project. Next slide, please. This is an, uh, an early on um, aerial of the overall site with a little stepping back a little further to give a better context of where it is. To the left, you'll see the orange uh, box is the site. And to the right side of the orange box is Quarry Road. And to the left of it is Jordan Road. Um, the next slide. This is a zoomed in photos of the actual site. Uh, this is an interesting site. It has a topographic change of 30 feet on one side and. Uh, 50 feet at the back, so it's it's on a hill. So it is. Uh, so looking at the photos, the top left is standing at the intersection, looking up Jordan Road, and the top right photo is standing at the intersection, looking up Corey Road. So you kind of get a sense of the general site. Next slide, please. This is the overall of basically three lots. The site, the long site, has been subdivided, and as Lance mentioned, the dashed white line indicates the Boston uh, city limit versus the Brookline city limit for lots two and three, which would be developed for single family homes. Uh, we are here to discuss only lot one, which is about the stats are here, but generally we have provided a variety of one bedroom and two bedroom units, four story building, parking is in the basement and because of the uh, hilly nature, the parking is completely tucked away from public eye. Um, we had met a series with uh, neighbors as well as community meetings and worked with the BPD design staff and with BTD on traffic calming issues and the fact that Quarry Road is downhill and traffic was a significant concern. 
uh, we made sure that the vehicular access would not own Cory Road, which was a strong recommendation from the neighborhood. Um, so that is focused on Jordan Road and the pedestrian uh, access uh, for people to use every day in the lobby is off of Cory Road. Next slide, please. This is a landscape plan that shows uh, basically the building and the way it interacts with the street. So Cory Road on the right uh, shows the pedestrian access on the top right corner, whereas you see loading and garage, which is at the bottom part, which faces Jordan Road. Um, this project we did as we went through design iterations last year, we made significant changes to the project. One was uh, looking at the massing of the building because it sits at a corner lot and it, it can be daunting as a scale for the scale of the building. So we looked at stepping back the top floor uh, to be respectful. We looked at the model setbacks along Cory Road. So the front of Cory Road is in line with the rest of the uh, buildings and the uh, along Cory Road and the building kind of wraps around Jordan Road. And uh, there was a specific uh, request to make sure that trash pickup, any kind of Uber drop off, they had a dedicated entrance into the building. So to the left, uh, there's two arrows at the bottom. The one on the left that's called loading is basically an entry and for car drop off in that location. Next please. This further explains the landscaping because it's at the corner. We looked at different ways of adding landscaping using good landscape that's native plantings, using a variety of um, shrubs and trees to make sure we add that level of variety on the landscaping and soften the edges of the building along Cory Road, along Jordan, and at the back at the patio space for the residents so that we respect the, the hill. Next slide, please. The slide shows the building elevations, which is predominantly the building is a warmer red brick tone. Uh, we use neighborhood context uh, like such as bays, which are very predominant on Cory Road. Uh, we've used, uh, this is a painted fiber cement, but looking at detailing, it's a little hard to see in this one, but there's trim work um, along the bays and on the top floor that is recessed back to add that level of detail to both the elevation, to all the elevations on all three sides. Next, please. Uh, we'll conclude with a few before and afters because it's the best way to explain the context. So this one is standing up quarry, looking down. The site is somewhere in the middle after this uh, building that's in brown color. Uh, next slide, please. And that's, uh, oh, thank you. So this one shows the current, uh, the proposed building, which is the fourth story that is set back and the three story in the, in the front, which respects the architecture of the bays along Cory Road. And the pedestrian access in the main entrance is what is visible near the trees at the entrance there. Next slide, please. This is the last set of existing and proposed. This is being further back down at a lower elevation, looking up towards the building would be um, on the left. Um, next, please. The final slide shows what the contextually what the building would look and feel like at this intersection, um, where it shows it kind of wraps around to Jordan. That was the last slide that I had. Thank you, and that's it for my end. That concludes our presentation. Okay, thank you. I'll do my job. Um, do, do, we have, do we have any questions from the board or comments? Okay, hearing and seeing none. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you. Good night. Great project. Uh, item number 19 request authorization to issue a certificate. Start that again. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E, small project review of the zoning code for the construction of 19 affordable residential rental units 
eight off street parking spaces and 26 bicycle storage spaces located at 151 Spencer Street to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for zoning relief um, and to take all related actions. Stephen. Uh, good evening and thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. Um, my name is Stephen Harvey and I'm a project manager at the BPDA and I wanna thank you for your time today. The project I bring before you today is 151 Spencer Street located in the Conman Square section of Dorchester, a neighborhood within Boston. On September 27, 2019, the Boston Planning and Development Agency received a small uh, project review application from Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, the proponent. Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation proposed to construct a 19 unit, all affordable rental building on this site that was formerly an automobile repair garage. The site in question, which lies at 270 Talbot and Spencer, is made up of two city owned parcels that went through the RFP process in 2005, 2015, and then again in 2018. Conman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, along with T T Lee Development, qualified and were ultimately chosen by the Department of Neighborhood Development, D and D, to develop to develop to develop the parcels. Excuse me. For the past year, Conman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation has worked with D and D and the BPDA to bring forth the project you see today. If approved, the new construct the new structure will contain 19 affordable units, rental units. The proposed project will also include eight exterior parking spaces and 22 bicycle parking spaces. On November 19th, 2019, I held a public meeting at the Great Hall at Common Square Health Center. There, the project was positively received by those present. The November 19th meeting was advertised in the Dorchester Reporter in the Bay State Banner. With that said, I would like to pass it over to Anthony, one of the project architects from Studio Luz Architects. Anthony will run through the project presentation and we will answer any questions you put forward. I also have Kill, the project manager from Codman Square Neighborhood Development. Kill is also available to take questions from the board. Thank you again for your time. And you can go to your next slide. And Anthony, you need to unmute yourself. He's not muted. Okay, how, how is that? Yes, you're All right, sorry about that. It was looking for the wrong microphone. Um, again, I, I just said thank you very much for hearing us today. We're very proud to be part of this project with the Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation. Um, they're, they're a community-based organization that has over 40 years of experience in real estate development in the Codman Square area with a focus on affordable housing development. Um, so we've worked very hard to, to meet and establish some important goals of uh, creating affordable housing that's socially responsible, as well as in being environmentally responsible. This is an incredibly important mission, and we're, again, we're very proud to be part of it. So our, our project, uh, in summary, has uh, 19 affordable units, um, seven one-bedrooms, eight two-bedrooms, and four three-bedrooms. Uh, there are two accessible units and one sensory accessible unit to, for a total of three units within the project. As you can see here, we have over 50 FTE jobs, uh, 22 uh, bike storage, which is a little over the one-to-one -one ratio recommended. We're also striving uh, to meet the passive house design practices and meet the city's zero carbon emission standards. Uh, next slide, please. So this site is just located off of Talbot Ave, uh, within a five minute walk of the Talbot Ave commuter station. There's also a bus stop uh, right on the corner of Talbot uh, at the end of the block. So uh, this is a transit oriented site. Next, please. The context, there is a mixture of multifamily homes along Spencer Street. And this project will help to, again, reintroduce residential use to, the, to this end of the block. Next, please. Um, we're also very interested in how this project can regenerate the community by removing the underutilized buildings that have been abandoned for over a decade here. Next. So this is an aerial collage that shows the building within the context of the neighborhood. Uh, it's intended, again, to revitalize and connect uh, the residential fabric back to Talbot. You're going to see the other project coming up shortly. Um, <clears throat> so there, as you can see with this, the roof is a light color. It's intended to be a cool roof. Uh, TPO system and the building roof will be PV ready, photovoltaic ready. Next, please. 
next please here's our overall site plan and we propose the public the access to the project is from spencer street we'll be introducing uh, improvements to the sidewalk uh, which will be about 11 foot 8 at the entry area to the building itself and 8 foot 6 along the entire uh, sidewalk in length of spencer spencer street there will also be eight on-site parking spaces um, and the important an important green space uh, this space on the back of the property or <clears throat> kind of towards the southwest if you will is about 1600 square feet and it will serve as a backyard uh, for the residents there will be direct access um, from the first floor to a patio a play yard some picnic tables grills and gardening areas in the back next please so here's a enlarged ground floor plan and again, we're, we really did work hard to conceive this as a social space with shared amenities, including the, the bike storage room, which we've talked about. Uh, there's, area, there's even some area for some bike repairs. There's also a laundry lounge that has couches, tables, media access to make this a family-friendly type space. Uh, there's also a designed and secure male parcel area here. Again, we're striving to make this ground level active uh, and participate in the daily life of the neighborhood and the residents. Next, please. The, this is the typical floors um, above showing the mixture of units. Uh, all of the units are compliant with the DD design standards and been carefully reviewed with the DD staff. Uh, what we do like to note, there are some outdoor balconies uh, in the building that allow people to have connections back to the neighborhood and some, and some fresh air. You'll see those on the renderings as well. Next, please. So in terms of the context, the building, the composition of the building's massing does respond to the proportion, scale, and rhythms of the existing buildings along Spencer Street. Uh, this, again, this approach has been reviewed and developed with the BPDA staff as well as D&D. So there are three distinct three-story volumes that, again, relate to the width of the existing houses. The houses on Spencer Street often have bays and porches that really call out and create distinct entryways. And the proposed bays between our major volumes relate to those entryways. Uh, those are where the balconies are located above. So there's this consistency of inside and outside relationships along those bays as you move down the block. Next, please. These are the building elevations. Uh, the main volumes are differentiated by color and texture. Uh, so the fourth floor is set back um, and emphasized with kind of an accent paneling. Uh, so we're using a proposed combination of fiber cement clapboard siding, which is consistent with most of the buildings in the, in the block, with accents of cement board panels um, and bring color and differentiate, differentiate some textures in the project. Next, please. So this is our a view from the Spencer Street side, and you can get, begin to get a sense of how this building uh, would sit within its context. And there's also, like I said, there's a one story at the entry on the corner, it's a covered area. So you can provide some shelter for people coming home every day or, or leaving in the morning. Um, and again, trying to make that kind of welcoming corner, which is facing towards Talbot Ave. Next, please. And this is the last uh, perspective here where you can see that the, there's a, uh, the parking area is in the foreground with the backyard off to the left, uh, kind of stretching the whole length of the back of the building. We've also introduced one of these bays on the side of the building to, again, try to keep with the kind of consistent proportion and rhythm all the way around the building as, it, as you move, move around it in three dimensions. And last slide, and I think that is, this is it. This was the summary slide. So thank you very much and um, appreciate any comments or questions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, do we have any uh, questions or comments from the board? I'm just curious, does this relate to um, other projects that are on our agenda tonight? Yes, it does. Uh, Talbot Ave, 270 Talbot is coming up. That's the parcel adjacent to this. They're shared, uh, shared sight line. And Codman is also developing uh, the 25 uh, New England Ave project. So we have three projects that are essentially adjacent to one another? Yes. Two that are adjacent. Both Two that are adjacent. Could we see the other one too? So we're not approving this piecemeal? It's the next item on the agenda. Um, so should we, do you want to do that? Well, I'm just curious as to how they relate to each other visually. 
No, I understand. I mean, I understand they're separate projects, but. Yeah. Um, Secretary Paul. Yes. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll accept an acknowledgement that these are related to each other. Um, I, I do think that there ought to be a way that we can see them both because the two of them together will have an impact on, on the neighborhood more than each one separately. We can hold the vote while we go through the presentation of the next project, if you prefer, and then we can come back and vote on them separately. Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. I mean, that's a great, great catch, Dr. Landsmark. Um, so, so what, why don't we, why don't we do that? Um, so we are going to hold the vote. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we are going to, um, move on to agenda number 20, hear that, um, and then proceed with, with the votes. Um, so if you just sit tight, um, <laughs> we will we will be right back. Okay, so agenda item number 20, request authorization to issue a cer certification of approval pursuant to article 80E, small project review of the zoning code for the construction of 21 affordable residential units 2,960 square feet of two retail spaces, nine off-street parking spaces, and 21 bicycle storage spaces located at 270 Talbot Avenue to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for Zoning Relief and to take all related actions. Stephen. Okay, thank you. Uh, good, uh, good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. My name is Stephen Harvey and I'm the project manager at the BBGA and I want to thank you again for your time. Uh, the project I bring for you today is 270 Talbot Ave located in the Cotton Square section of Dorchester, a neighborhood within Boston. On November 18th, 2019, uh, the Boston Planning and Development Agency received a small project review application from Tealy Development LLC, the proponent. Uh, Tealy Dev Development LLC proposed to construct a 21 unit all affordable rental building with first floor commercial space on site that was uh, formerly a automobile repair garage as well. The, this project is the counterpart to 151 Spencer Street, the 151 Spencer Street project. So like the 151 Spencer Street project, this project lies at 270 Talbot and Spencer. Like 151 Spencer Street, the site is made up of two city owned parcels that went through RFP, went through the RFP process in 2015, and then again in 2018. Tealy Development LLC and Common Square Neighborhood Development Corporation both qualified and were ultimately chosen by the Department of Neighborhood Development, DND, to develop the parcels. For the past year, Tealy Development has worked with DND and the BBDA to bring forth the projects you'll see today. If approved, the new structure will contain 21 all affordable workforce housing units with ground floor commercial space. The proposed project will also include nine exterior parking spaces and 21 bicycle parking spaces. On September 3rd, 2020, I held a virtual public meeting uh, that was uh, well attended and where the project was well received. That September 3rd meeting was advertised in the Dorchester Reporter in the Bay State Banner. With that said, I would like to pass it over to Anthony again and uh, from Studio Lou's Architect and Anthony will run through the project presentation and uh, we will answer any questions you have. Um, I also have Travis Lee representing T. Lee Development. He will also answer any questions that the board has. Stephen, if okay with you, I will uh, introduce the project. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Well, BPDA board, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to speak tonight. It's a pleasure. My name is Travis Lee. I am uh, Tealy Development. I'm a Dorchester resident and have spent the last seven or eight years developing mixed use, mixed income properties in Dorchester specifically. To date, I have either planned or developed 85 units of housing, all of which are income restricted around 80 to 90 percent of the area's median income and i have been a part of developing 40,000 square feet of commercial space all in all in dorchester including the dorchester brewing company the fields corner business lab and other small restaurants 
I am very pleased to be a part of this 270 Talbot Avenue project. As Stephen said, back in 2018, Codman Square NDC and myself submitted a joint proposal to develop two distinct different buildings on a single city owned piece of property. And so we, su we submitted a, a response to the city RFP that did, not, uh, that did not say we were a joint venture for the entirety of the project, but that we would each develop and own and manage individually two separate buildings on the city's land and that we would subdivide the property accordingly. As Stephen mentioned, the property has an existing garage on it. And uh, in 2019, both Common Square and myself received tentative designation as developers. And we've spent the last uh, greater part of a year working very closely with BPDA designers and BND designers to come to a mutually agreeable design, which uh, now the community, the city, and the development team is really excited about. Studio Loose Architects, who you just heard from in the past presentation, Anthony is on this uh, presentation as well, uh, have been the designers. The project includes 29 uh, units of rental housing that will be priced at or below 90% of the area's median income. Uh, most of those are studios and some of them are one bedrooms. It's a four story building with an elevator and about 3000 square feet of ground floor retail space. Anthony, if you'd go to the next slide, that would be fabulous. Um, as I mentioned, so 21 units of workforce housing, uh, six retail jobs that will be permanent, uh, while we have around 65 short-term construction jobs that would be created from the project. We have 21 indoor secured uh, bike storage spaces. And uh, as may have been mentioned before, this property is about one block, one and a half blocks to the Fairmount Line commuter rail station. This project is also being built to meet passive house standards. So at that, I would love to turn it over to Anthony, the designer, to share more about that. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Travis. And again, thank you to the board. Um, maybe uh, next slide, please. You know, for the, I guess just for the record, my name is Anthony Fiumarini with Studio Luz Architects. Uh, so this is just again, a, a kind of brief summary of what Travis just kind of read off with a, a kind of preview of the building in its in its context uh, next slide please so our um, again our, our locating the site which uh, you've just seen it is a transit oriented development we are within a five minute walking distance of Talbot F station there will also be a bus stop right in front of our our building uh, next stop please next slide oh looks like we're missing an image here um, <clears throat> so again this is just speaking to the the uh, the opportunity here that by removing the underutilized and abandoned buildings uh, will begin, begin to regenerate the connections and uh, vitality along Talbot Ave. Uh, next, please. So uh, Talbot Ave does, has a, it does have a mixture of mixed use type buildings, uh, residential as well as commercial. And our building, it seeks to kind of pull together this, these different kinds of types. We will have retail on the ground level as well as some uh, shared amenities on the ground level with uh, residential above. We also are trying to pull from the different uh, types of materials, patterns, and uh, character of the neighborhood to develop our to, in our proposal. Next, please. So this is the aerial view that is it's based, it's the same as you just saw in the last uh, presenta uh, presentation, but um, you can start to see how these two buildings are are related. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the obviously the building within context, uh, and it will we do see it as something that begins to contribute and connect some of the larger massing of buildings. You can see slightly to the uh, to the east and the west, opposite of our building on Talbot Ave. This this serves to kind of begin to connect those together. Next, next please. Um, so here is our context plan. Um, I'm not sure what's happening in the background there, but that the this is essentially shows where the the proposed uh, division line is between the two parcels that we were just discussing. The pink line is is our site. Uh, so with this <clears throat> with this uh, Im improvements on this particular site, we will have uh, again eight on-site parking spaces for this. Uh, shared outdoor 320-foot 
square foot patio, uh, new tree plantings, which are kind of to the southwest, about 815 square feet of open green space in that corner. Uh, sidewalks will also be improved uh, with the corner of the building at Talbot Ave being set back so that outdoor activities could happen on that corner. Um, a great sidewalk cafe potentially uh, and with some seating could be possible there. Uh, sidewalks will be widened along both Spencer Street to 12 feet and Talbot Ave to 11 feet. And again, the wider sidewalks will allow easier pedestrian movement and activities to take place near the retail areas. Uh, next, please. So here is an enlarged ground floor plan. So again, it, it's similar to, in, in concept, we have really tried to activate the ground floor as a kind of social center for the home, uh, for, the people, for the residents that live here. Uh, there are shared amenities. Our bike storage is located here, which is direct access from the outside as well as access to the lobbies. Uh, but there's also a media lounge with a communal table, a small kitchenette, and direct access to the outdoor patio space. Um, so again, a, a family-friendly atmosphere is being promoted here. Uh, there's also a interior kind of secured mail and parcel area uh, on this ground level. Next, please. So these are the typical uh, upper levels <clears throat> of the building, uh, showing the mixture of unit types. Uh, the, the units, again, are all complying with the D&D design standards and have been reviewed carefully with the D&D staff. Uh, the interesting thing here is we are sharing, there's a shared laundry facility for each floor of the building. Uh, so that people can simply come outside of their unit and, and do their laundry. So we're promoting a kind of convenience and kind of activating the common areas. Next, please. Here is a uh, context elevation showing how we, we were looking at the varied rhythms, patterns of the, uh, the buildings along Talbot Ave, uh, taking these kind of bay modules, which are and shallow relief on the brick building to the right, but then beginning to carry them over and transition them to the other bay modules you'll see up the street. <clears throat> so again, proportion, scale, rhythms, fenestration patterns, all of that was kind of part of the consideration for the development of the facades of the building. Uh, we're proposing that the building, to complement some of the existing brick, uh, the, the kind of background of the building will be all a, a terracotta paneling. Uh, the bays themselves will be a uh, sembrit or a fiber cement type panel um, and then with, which have some accent panels in between the windows as well. Uh, next, please. And so here you start to see the, the overall view of the building where, again, the, the corner on Talbot Ave is, a, is an important intersection um, as a public space. And so we were doing something kind of special with the way that the, the bays begin to merge and fold at that corner. It also, uh, there's a, again, it's, the ground floor is pulled back, creating a nice space on the sidewalk. But then as you move up Spencer Street, um, the building massing kind of shifts down to the lower three-story scale. And so these are kind of important moves to try to fit this building into the context and make sure that what is pronounced, what is kind of foreground is really in scale and in rhythm with its neighbors. Uh, next slide, please. And here's the other kind of view from the opposite end. Um, <clears throat> looking at the building or you can start to see the, the bays of the building in the foreground, um, uh, the kind of transition to the back of the building where again, the, the fourth floor is set back, the, street, the three story mass is, is more prominent as you move towards the, the parking area in, in the rear. And that, that concludes, but thank you very much. Okay, um, do we have any, um... Any questions from the board? Um, now having seen um, the previous project, agenda item 19 and 20, um, uh, do you have any questions or comments? I'm comfortable voting on uh, 20 and then going back to 19 so that we can um, get both of these done. I do have a question about the affordability, you know, 270 Talbot's being called a workforce housing and Mr. Lee mentioned 90% AMI, which I'm sure is uh, not an income level of the people living in that neighborhood. And I'm wondering what is the AMI level, what are the AMI levels in the, the previous presentation that are also being called affordable? The 151 Spencer Street has an AMI of 
the whole thing? Yes. Okay, great. I know we desperately need workforce housing and uh, the deeper affordability units, and I just, uh, well, I, I, it's great to have those both there. Thank you. Great. Um, any other questions from the board? Okay, so um, hearing and seeing number, well, before we do that, we're gonna vote first on the um, the project that we just saw. So item number 20, um, 270 Talbot. Um, so that is the, the vote that we're taking right now. So uh, for 270 Talbot Avenue, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you and congratulations. And I'm just going to, for the record, reread agenda item number 19 and then we can take a vote on that. So number 19, request authorization to issue a cert certification. I cannot say that name, that, that word today. Certification, I'm sorry, of approval pursuant to Article 80E, Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 19 affordable residential rental units, eight off-street parking spaces, and 26 bicycle storage spaces located at 151 Spencer Street to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for Zoning Relief Necessary and to take all related actions. A motion is in order. So moved. All right, as a second. Okay, right, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Monahan? Aye. Ted, uh, <laughs> Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. So uh, both 19 and 20 are approved. Thank you very much. Great projects. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, item number 21, request authorization to issue a certification of approval for pursuant to Article 80E, Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 23 affordable residential rental units, a 750 square foot, foot community room, 12 Elf Street parking spaces, and 31 bicycle storage spaces located at 5 through 29 New England Avenue, to recommend approval to the Board of Appeals for zoning relief necessary and to take all related actions. Stephen. Uh, good evening and again, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. My name is Stephen Harvey and I'm a project manager at the BPDA. The project I bring before you today is 25 New England Ave, located in the Codman Square section of Dorchester, uh, a neighborhood within Boston. On September 27th, 2019, the Boston Planning and Development Agency received a small project review application from Common Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, the proponent. Common Square Neighborhood Development Corporation proposed to construct a 23 unit all affordable rental building on the site that was formerly an automobile repair business. The site in question, which lies on New England Ave, is made up of five smaller parcels that Common Square Neighborhood Development Corporation has collected. The project resides within an area of Codman Square, where Codman Square Development Corporation is providing substan a substantial amount of affordable housing, i.e. Talbot, Talbot Commons, uh, to, to the neighborhood. Uh, so this endeavor to provide affordable housing to the community was nothing new to Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation. For the past year, Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation has worked with uh, Department of Neighborhood Development, DND, and uh, the BPA to bring forth the project that you'll see today. If approved, the new structure will contain 23 affordable rental units. The proposed project will also include 12 exterior parking spaces and 29 bicycle parking spaces. On November 19, 2019, I held a public meeting at the Great Hall at the at Common Square Health Center. There, the project was positively received by those present. Uh, the November 19th meeting was advertised in the Dorchester Reporter in the Bay State Banner. With that said, I'll pass it over to Anthony, uh, the, one of the project architects from Studio Liz Architects. 
um, Anthony will run through the presentation and we'll take any questions that you have. I also have Kiel, the project manager representing Conman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation. Kiel is also available to take questions from the board if there are any. And I'll pass it over to Anthony. Great, thank, thank you once again, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. Um, again, my name is Anthony Piumarini, the principal at Studios Architects. Uh, so we've been working very closely with DND and BPDA uh, and striving to really create affordable housing that's socially responsible, achieves a high envi environmental performance standards, um, and is really something the neighborhood can be proud of. So I'm, I'm very humbled to be part of all of this. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, as Stephen mentioned, we do have, these are the, the, the statistics here. We have 23 affordable units. There are six one bedrooms, 12 two bedrooms, and five three bedrooms. Uh, three accessible units plus one being sensory accessible, so for a total of four. Um, uh, 50 FTE jobs being produced. Uh, 29 bike storage, again, that's a bit better than the one-to-one uh, -one requirement. And a zero carbon emission standard uh, with passive health design standards being implemented here. Uh, so again, we're trying to create some really high quality buildings. Next, please. So here is our, our site overview, um, where you can see the, the site parcel is adjacent to the commuter rail line. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those the challenges for that, that we've uh, tried to mitigate with our design approach. Uh, it is a transit oriented development, given its proximity to Talbot Ave station and, and bus lines on Talbot Ave. Next, please. So in terms of the context, uh, there's a lot, a lot going on here, which is really exciting. It'll contribute to the revitalization of this, uh, of these blocks and this corner, the edge of the neighborhood. Um, so the project will continue the trajectory again as part of that second phase of the Talbot Commons project. Uh, we see again a kind of diversity of, of building types, and we're we're really excited to contribute to the vitality of of this area. Next, please. So this is the 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 site highlighted in the magenta here with. Uh, some photos of the existing buildings um, on the site. Uh, what we're interested in doing here is actually, this is a, a brick wall. Uh, we're going to be harvesting those bricks, reclaiming some of those bricks and using them in our project uh, that was part of the yellow brick wall. A little bit of the industrial heritage of this site will, will remain. Uh, next, please. This is a, a, a collage overview of the project um, as it stands. The You can see the, the there's kind of a shift in the volume, if you will, two boxes. Uh, that is dealing with the triangular site and beginning to pull the, the building away from the, the railroad tracks uh, behind and, and thinking about the, the kind of noise that is there. Um, we're also, and also create a, a, a kind of edge to the neighborhood. Um, there are, there's buildings in construction in the foreground here that are kind of similar in scale to what we're proposing. Uh, but again, you can see the roofscape here is a similar strategy where we have a TPO cool roof system uh, with photovoltaic ready, uh, ready to go up there. Uh, next, please. Here is our site plan, which uh, depicts the proposed access from a New England Ave. Uh, it's the, the access to the parking lot is right between uh, strategically placed to create a kind of buffer between the existing light industrial uses of the neighboring building and <clears throat> helps to uh, uh, obviously kind of provide the parking and, and access. We're also providing a, uh, a 1500 square foot kind of green space there that is a kind of entry on the, on the corner of New England Ave as part of the entry sequence to the building. So we'll have a tree canopy and a, and a nice green space to walk through to enter into the building. Uh, Sidewalks will be improved as well, widening them to 12 feet, uh, which allows for tree plantings and some front garden spaces to the units at the ground level. There'll be also approximately 6,000 square feet of mixed use green space all between the building and the, uh, the, tr the, 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 the barrier of the railroad tracks. Um, the outdoor areas will have planting areas, some seating areas, patio with grills, and some play spaces. So again, a, a different kinds of uses uh, that can be done outside. So that that also that green space also serves as an important buffer um, with the planting created there for the noise created by the commuter line. Next, please. Um, a, our ground level planning is really thought of as a again a, a, a active social space for the residents of the building. There are the shared amenities located on on this 
level of bike storage with direct access from the outside leading to the inside. Um, there is a designated mail and parcel area. There's also a, a media laundry social lounge, um, kind of a mixing of all of these things so that uh, the everyday events uh, that everyone has doing their laundry can actually be something that is a kind of a gathering space. This also, there's a kitchenette there. And so this in, leads directly to an outdoor patio so that this is a indoor outdoor connection is really important, uh, emphasizing uh, kind of family friendly usage as well. On the ground floor, the, the units at the front of the back of the building also have small outdoor kind of garden spaces um, to the, uh, so let's see, uh, north is to the right in this particular drawing so to the east and the west uh, or top and bottom of the page there are kind of outdoor spaces for those ground level units to use next please here are the typical upper level floors for the building again we have gone through uh, kind of a careful review of all of this with dnd um, and so the what's important though is again the units on the west side or the upper side of the page those are going to be uh, adjacent to the rail line. So we're taking careful attention to the uh, type of assembly that's being used there. Uh, so some of the things that we're taking uh, account for, the triple glazed windows will be used along that facade, um, which also help achieve our passive house standards. And we'll be looking at noise reducing assemblies along those walls as well as the ceiling and floor assemblies to make sure that uh, noise is not a, a problem. Next, please. Here's the typical elevation. Um, the context for the project is, is really the, the tree lines that, that buffer uh, the rail line. You can see one of the industrial buildings on the, on the right-hand side. So the context is more, more presented in some of the earlier photographs here. <clears throat> um, but our massing is, uh, again, trying to respond to a lot of the three-story buildings that are in the neighborhood. The fourth floor, again, is set back. Uh, bringing in some of those bay rhythms that are kind of common to the neighborhood and letting that begin to accentuate plan, uh, the, I'm sorry, the facade. Uh, materials being used are a, a fiber cement clapboard, uh, which is the lighter gray color here for the majority of the building. Uh, fiber cement panels, which would be painted uh, to create the bays and, and have a little bit different detailing, uh, and the, as well as the fourth floor. And then the kind of yellow color at the base, that is the reclaimed brick. So that'll be part of the entries and part of the public spaces as well as the kind of water table at the ground will have this reclaimed brick uh, from the, the previous building. So some of the history of the site is, is maintained. Next, please. And here is the a kind of overview as you come down to England Ave here. <clears throat> uh, you can see the, in the foreground here, uh, we've made, we haven't put the trees in because we wouldn't be able to see the building, but they're in the green space where the kids are playing. That's the, the little entry courtyard uh, leading to the entry with a canopy. There is a canopy for weather protection uh, with some lights for the, the nice brick that we're using. Um, and you enter between the two volumes of the building. Uh, next, please. And here is, a, a, again, a kind of a view, a little bit more frontal, uh, where you can see the bays themselves are creating a nice kind of breakdown of the building into smaller parts. But they're also a little bit playful. They change orientation and kind of look outwards in different directions to build some character. So that's, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Great, great. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from the board? Just a comment. I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, the um, uh, architects and um, landscape architects have women as principals, um, and that in two of the uh, three projects, the uh, head of the organization is a woman. Uh, we don't often have three projects uh, come up in a row that's like that, and it's nice to see. Mm. Agreed. We lose architects as a WMBE firm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, any additional questions from the board? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, congratulations on all the projects. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so item number 22. Request authorization to ratify and confirm the October 17, 2019 board action 
to execute an affordable rental housing agreement and restriction that requires the creation of five on-site IDP units and an IDP contribution of $14,000 to the IDP Special Revenue Fund in connection with the Wellington at 1301 project located at 1297 through 1305 Blue Hill Avenue, uh, Ms. Kerr. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, my apologies for the lack of a uh, working video camera. Good evening, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. At just about this time last year on October 17th, 2019, this board voted to approve the Wellington at 1301 project which will see the construction of 39 new residential rental units in three ground floor commercial and or retail spaces at 1297 to 1305 Blue Hill Avenue in Mattapan. Of the 39 residential units included in the project, five will be provided as income restricted units. In order to meet the full 13% requirement of the inclusionary development policy, the project must also provide a partial unit payment to the IDP special revenue fund. The board memo of last October erroneously called for a partial unit IDP payment in the amount of $40,000, which was reflective of a building program including 40 residential rental units, not 39 as ended up being the case. The action before you this afternoon, this evening rather, excuse me, requests the board's ratification and confirmation that the director be authorized to enter into an affordable rental housing agreement and restriction in connection with the Wellington at 1301 project which requires the creation of five on-site IDP units and a partial unit contribution of $14,000 to the IDP Special Revenue Fund. I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have on this matter. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number 23, request authorization to terminate the existing affordable rental housing agreement and restriction to enter into an affordable, to enter into an affordable housing agreement for the five IDP units located at 11 through 19 Wally Street project and to take all related actions. Raul. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Mad, uh, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. Uh, by way of background, on March 15, 2018, the board voted to approve the 11-19 Wally, Wally Street project in the Orionite section of East Boston. The project as approved consisted of the demolition of the existing structures on the site and the construction of a four-story approximately 48,000 square foot residential building with 38 rental units, including five IDP units and 25 off street uh, parking spaces. Since the board approval, the, develop the developer executed all the necessary agreements as outlined in the original uh, board approval. Uh, they also obtained the necessary zoning relief and commenced with the construction of the project. On August 17, 2020, the developer through their attorney submitted a document to the BPDA requesting authorization to change the residential units in the project from rentals to condominiums. As a result of the proposed change, the developer is also seeking the BPDA board to authorize the director to terminate the previously executed affordable rental housing agreement in connection with the five IDP rental units and authorize the director to enter into an affordable housing agreement in connection with the five IDP units now as condominiums. Uh, no, other project, uh, no other changes to the project are being requested and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. All moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes, thank you. Item number 24. Request authorization to co-petition the Public Improvement Commission for the discontinuance of portions of John F. Fitzgerald Surface Road to adopt an order of taking for parcels of land located at uh, John F. Fitzgerald Surface Road within parcel D7, aka Block 214, parcels one and two, 
in the downtown waterfront Faneuil Hall urban renewal area, project number Mass R-77 for the, for the 55 and to execute a deed to BRG 55 India LLC for said discontinuance parcels, a land disposition agreement and any and all documents necessary in connection with parcel D-7 and or the discontinuance of portions of John Fitzgerald Surface Road Raul. Again, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, members of the board. Uh, by way of background, on March 12, 2020, this board voted to approve the revised 55 India Street project, which was being proposed on an approximately 7,100 square foot parcel located across the street from the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Greenway and bound by India Street to the north, Franklin Street to the west, Well Street to the south, and John Fitzgerald Surface Road to the east. The project as approved consists of a 12 story mixed use building with approximately 4,000 square feet of ground floor retail space, uh, 29 condominium, rental, uh, condominium residential units, of which five will be designated as IDP units. This past September, we came before you seeking authorization to co-petition the city's public improvement commission for the discontinuance of portions of India, Franklin and Well Street, which are also within parcel D7 in the downtown waterfront Faneuil Hall urban renewal area. Uh, at that time, the board voted to approve that action. Uh, we're we are before you today, again, uh, request an authorization for a very similar action to the one approved in September, but specifically for below grade portions of John Fitzgerald Surface Road for the assembly of the project site and the development of the project. The city requires that the BPDA serve as a co-petitioner and intermediary in the discontinuance process overseen by the Public Improvement Commission. The vote of approval tonight would allow the BPDA to proceed with the discontinuance and transfer of the below grid portions of John Fitzgerald Surface Road and would ultimately allow for the approved project to proceed to construction in the near future. I'm also joined by members of the development team this evening and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Raul. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Item number 25, request authorization to approve the minor modification to the Charlestown Urban Renewal Plan to create parcels P-16A-5, P-16B-1, P-16B-2, P-16C-1, P-16-C2, and P-16-C3, and clarify their land uses. And allow Charlestown Urban Renewal Area parcels P-16A-5 P 16B 1, P 16B 2, and P 16C 1 to be disposed of pursuant to the Butter Parcels Program. Ray. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. I'm requesting that you please approve, I'll call them a group of four parcels rather than go through all those names again, for inclusion in the Butter Parcels Program. As you may recall, the Abutter Parcels Program was originally approved by the board on September 30th, 2004. This program sells small, unbuildable BPDA-owned vacant land parcels to adjacent homeowners as deed-restricted open space. These parcels may be used for side, front, and rear yards, walkways, gardens, parking, and structures associated with open space and parking in connection with residential uses. Disposition asking prices will be based upon either assessed value or appraised value as appropriate. The disposition te team of the real estate division working with the urban renewal and legal teams is preparing to launch new rounds of the Abutter Parcels program and has identified 26 parcels of unbuildable vacant land for inclusion in the program. Staff will periodically bring groups of parcels from within this list of 26 to the board for approval to be offered in an Abutter Parcels round. Uh, the parcels included in today's group are located on a steep wooded and brush covered landlocked hillside 
off of Mead Street in Charlestown, known as Nanny Goat Hill. Previous community engagement has confirmed that the community prefers that these parcels remain open space. On September 21st, 2020, EPDA staff hosted a virtual meeting via Zoom for abutters of Group 1. Several expressed interest in applying for the parcels when the program applications are made available. If approval is received today, staff will make program applications available to all direct abutters for 60 days. After evaluating the applications received, staff will return to the board to obtain approval to convey individual parcels, parcels to eligible abutters according to program guidelines. Additionally, the minor modification uh, requested today is necessary to facilitate their disposition. The minor mod will create the urban renewal parcels within the Charlestown Urban Renewal Plan and also clarify their land use within the plan. I'm happy to answer any questions. And just um, to avoid confusion, four of the parcels will be offered through the um, Abutter program and two others that are sort of on the other side of Nanny Goat Hill will be offered in, in an RFP at a later date because they're slightly different. So um, thanks. Great, thanks for that for that context. Um, do we have um, any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Ms. Brian. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Okay, so. To the club's public hearings already. Item number 29 has been removed. Brings us to um, 30. Item number 30, contractual. Uh, I need a motion to pay our bills. I move we pay our bills. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Uh, Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes, please pay the bills. And finally, agenda item number 31, um, director's update, uh, uh, Director Golden, floor is yours. Good evening, Madam Chair, and through you to the members. Um, uh, you know, we're, we remain mired in a really troubled world, a difficult economy devastated by by COVID and the, and the public health concerns uh, remain paramount in, in our consciousness in Boston. But, but tonight the, there was some really bright lights and, and I wanna focus on them. Really some significant bright lights in the past few weeks regarding our activity here um, at the BPDA on behalf of the people of Boston. So first of all, tonight you approved three fully affordable projects in Dorchester. These development projects make significant progress on the BPDA's and Mayor Walsh's commitment to creating affordable housing uh, to support a strong working class, a strong middle class. And last month in September, you um, approved uh, a significant number of new uh, units of housing, 90% of these new units permitted were income restricted. The most income restricted housing in any month since 2014. So it was a, a really interesting month in the middle of, of this uh, economic struggle and this pandemic we achieved some really positive outcomes. So this month and last month, and I'm not even included, I'm just talking about the two normal board meetings. We also of course included Suffolk Downs, um, which yields 900 more units of on-site affordable housing at Suffolk Downs and uh, another 500 units of affordable housing uh, 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 off-site. So a really, compelling um, and powerful story uh, when it comes to affordable housing in the past several weeks. Uh, I'm also pleased that tonight you voted um, in our human resources uh, portion of the, uh, of, of the meeting to approve the appointment of Barry Reeves as the agency's 
first ever director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Barry currently serves as the assistant director of investigations and training for the city of Boston in its HR department. And Barry will bring over 12 years of experience in diversity and equity management to his role here at the BPDA. Barry previous, previously worked in similar roles for both the United States Navy and the United States Army. And he also served on active duty in the Army for 18 years. In his new role, Barry will serve as a member of the agency's uh, senior staff. Um, we welcome his participation in the work of this agency. And I'm confident, as are all of those who've engaged with Barry in recent weeks, that he will help us foster a more inclusive, equitable, welcoming, and supportive agency, both internally, and bring that same equity lens to our external activities in the planning realm, the development review realm, the land disposition realm. So I want to thank all those on the hiring committee for the time they dedicated throughout the interview process. We did interview several candidates, and we look forward to welcoming Barry to the Boston Planning and Development Agency in the near term. So I, I want to reflect a little bit on Suffolk Downs, which was the subject of our special board proceeding three weeks ago tonight, uh, we dedicated one full session, took about seven hours of public testimony on that all important project. Uh, the only reason I didn't have much to say that night is because we started early evening on one day and ended early morning the following day after midnight. So I didn't want to prolong uh, the, the conversation then. Uh, given the amount of time dedicated to this subject, but I, I do want to prolong the conversation a little bit now so that I can talk about the role played by BPDA staff. So you permitted one of the most significant things ever done by this agency, a PDA master plan that, that permitted uh, 10 million square feet plus of new development. And that's just on the Boston side of the line. There's another 6 million on the Revere side of the Suffolk Downs line. So it's one of the biggest things ever permitted by the BPDA. And working, it's not just about the size of the complexity of the benefits that flow from the project. It, it sent a really important signal in a difficult time that working closely with Mayor Walsh and our colleagues in civic government and, and city government and, and, and our partners and residents throughout the city, that we were, we were able to demonstrate that in the midst of this pandemic and economic crisis, we were still getting important things done for the people of Boston. So that's really an important theme that came out of that night and I hope communicates an important message to people 